Hi folks, welcome to the Silicon Valley Health Institute where we want to bring you the latest and the greatest in uh, health information. We bring experts, we're a uh, 501c nonprofit. So if you wanna join, if you wanna make sure you're on an email list, be sure to put that in the chat and um, we'll continue from there. We have two guests tonight. One is Dr. Thomas Lewis and his colleague, Dr. Michael Carter. So let me tell you about my, uh, th Dr. Thomas Lewis. He holds a PhD from MIT and continuing education from the Harvard School of Public Health. Since his dad came down with Alzheimer's 20 years ago, he has dedicated his life to determine how to better predict Alzheimer's and chronic diseases in general. Working with key clinicians at the Harvard Medical School, his team developed advanced AI-driven algorithms to predict a person's mortality risk in both the near and distant future. Part of this algorithm is predictive capability for major chronic diseases. He has coined the diagnostic protocol four dimensions of health because the measurements span four dimensions, risk and other determinants of health, physiology, pathology, and existing disease states. All of these measurements are designed to properly place anyone on a health disease continuum. The final feature of this program, which you'll discuss tonight, are the robust protocols to help a person reduce their disease risk and burden, the success of which is measured across, across the four dimensions. Lastly, he designed this program with both individuals and populations in mind because all testing is widely available, often online, and very affordable. His continued mission is to build this testing in the standard of care as a replacement for the existing sick care that we now have and approach this with a new true healthcare approach. Welcome, Dr. Lewis. Thank you very much. And Dr. Carter as well. We've uh, really co-developed a lot of the stuff we've done, done recently. And uh, it's quite a challenge to, you know, um, of course, my last name is Lewis. So Lewis and Clark were the pioneers. And uh, they had a tough time crossing the Missouri, right? And uh, we're having the same tough time crossing the Missouri. And we have to reach across the aisle to really be effective. And I think the whole idea is, and Dr. Carter did a brilliant uh, a talk uh, on the Black Health Trust Organization. And uh, Dr. Randall Maxey, who's a leader of that, he was former president of the National Medical Association. And we really need to meld acute care and chronic care. But I think right now we really just have an acute care system. And uh, you know, we, we pretend we can do some chronic predictions with our A1C and, and, and lipid measurements, but it, it's really highly ineffective. So you know, I ask a very simple question, where are you on the health disease continuum? And I looked on, your, on the website, Susan, and one of the quotes you had was, what we do kind of eliminates the whole concept of a disease diagnosis to some extent. I mean, it's the 80-20 rule, you know, and uh, I was just talking to a group today. There are 69,000 ICD-10 codes, 69,000 ICD-10 codes. But in, in, my, in my world, in Dr. Carter's world, you know, we can boil those down to four mechanisms. You know, so you, you know, how, you, I, how long would it take to count to 69,000? <laughs> take a long, long time. So how can you possibly manage all that and have a, you know, a really uh, foundational uh, health revival program, if you will, or health, health prevention program. But the whole concept of a continuum is you're no longer preventing disease. We all have some level of disease. You're just sliding yourself towards a more optimal end of the scale. Because the way that, the way that like the societies talk about things is if you have diabetes, now you have to take a drug. But if you're pre-diabetic, you can potentially reverse that and, and prevent becoming diabetic. It, it like ignores the fact that these, you know, we just lie on, everything's on a continuum. So anyway, since I get a lot of slides, I'm with the show and uh, let's figure out how to get the slides, things to actually go. So here's a little bit about um, myself. Um, Dr. Trump and I have written a number of things together. The first book, uh, The End of Alzheimer's, that's actually this, our second edition we first published back in 2011. It's called The Brain and Beyond. Then we've, we've built a physiological measurement we call your chronic disease temperature. So we have a book on that, how to take and lower your chronic disease temperature. Um, 
Dr. Trump was very big on subacute infection in causing cataract, glaucoma, macular disease, and Alzheimer's. And so we wrote a book on that. Um, here's a couple of things that Dr. Carter and I have written together this year. Um, the cytokine storm, and really it's the pre-cytokine storm, physiological health that determines whether you're gonna live or die from COVID, for example. Um, but there, the, the, the pre-cytokines are, you know, pre-cytokine storm is sort of the, what you have when you have a chronic condition. And then we have a paper where we talk about uh, risk modification um, and accurate measurement with our chronic disease temperature algorithm and our chronic disease assessment. And we show um, very good success with objectivity built into it in terms of reversing chronic diseases. Now, you know, Cleveland Clinic published a paper from their functional medicine practice that really their first one got a lot of notoriety. Um, it was about a year ago now, but there were no objective outcomes. And so, you know, like functional medicine has to get their act together and develop their own set of standards and evidence so that when they publish something, it has objectivity to it. You know, we, we're fighting when we try to get when we try to go over to the dark side and convince them we're right, the dark side always says, but we have evidence, you don't, you know, randomized controlled trials and things of that nature. We need to have at least population studies based on standard sets of data. And that's, that's what Dr. Carter and I are trying to push out to the, uh, the broader industry, wherever we can go. So my mentors, you know, Dr. Trump on the left, he unfortunately passed away. Um, he was an older gentleman. And then there's McCulley, the a pioneer of the homocysteine theory of cardiovascular disease. He was thrown out of Harvard in 1969 and blacklisted, so he couldn't even get a job in Massachusetts. But he famously came back to Harvard in 1998, uh, a big article in the New York Times, The Fall and Rise of Kilman McCulley. So McCulley has written so many papers on disease mechanisms, really a very um, prolific writer. And Dr. Trump was just the consummate uh, compassionate clinician, helping, you know, really working to solve individuals' holistic problems when they came in with an eye condition. And he dealt with very sick and very frail people. So all I'm really talking about today, ad nauseum, if you will, um, is we all lie on a health disease continuum. And at some point, there's a demarcation between you know, a disease and a non-disease, and it's an artificial line, even in diabetes, you know, is it A1C, is it glucose, what is it, what's the number? It's variable, and there's a lot of variability, you know, two people with the exact same diagnosis can be in very different locations on the continuum, and that determines their risk. And what we've really done is, you know, when you look at reference intervals for labs, they're not really very scientific when you look at what the, look at what the true definition is. So we've built a whole scale based on where do we see a statistical increase in early mortality? So every, every marker can be titrated to the same endpoint, an increase in early mortality. And I think it's a fairly reasonable, and, and it came from Dr. Trump. He said, you know, the only parameter that's really important is, you know, are you gonna die, or, are you gonna die young or not? And I said, that makes a lot of sense. But so our continuum approach, it's, it's not a disease prevention or wellness program, it's a disease reversal program. It eliminates the distinction between disease prevention and reversal by just saying, hey, you're on a continuum somewhere and we call it a disease, it's really artificial. Um, so human-made assignments become somewhat meaningless. I mean, obviously there are markers that are more metabolically oriented, uh, vascular oriented, brain oriented. And so there are, there are multiple continuums, but we, we've kind of put everything on, on an overarching how is your immune system responding to your current environment? And that's really what we use to dictate where you are on the continuum, irrespective of your uh, current state of conditions. And what's interesting in Alzheimer's is a lot of people are very robust and their labs aren't that bad. So what the heck's going on with them? And that's the, that's the concept of focal disease, where you have a, a severe disease state in a very small capsule of tissue. And so physiologically, you're not that, um, you don't look that sick, but that particular tissue is highly affected. Um, and then this approach uh, reflects the interconnectedness of biological systems. So um, as you said, Susan, I kind of changed the dimensions, continuums, you know, 
it's all the same lifestyle environmental is continuum one physiological two pathology i'll try to get there tonight that's um dimension three and i'll talk about our novel approach there and then continuum four is really not we're not measuring that in any great specificity but you know what medications you're on what diagnoses you have in the standard of care would be where you're placed on the disease status continuum it's kind of the least relevant of all of them because it's um, the other ones are more early in the process and much more actionable towards making people well. Where would you put, uh, let's say, hemochromatosis in that four categories? Hemochromatosis in that in that category. In it's a very narrow kind of malfunction um, in that one particular mechanism kind of um, becomes the, the, a single driving force for collapsing huge numbers of different systems. So I was just looking at it and just couldn't see like where that would, where you would put that. Interesting. You know, there's always going to be outliers in this process, you know, the 80, 20 rule, but we've seen gut dysbiosis affect iron metabolism significantly. And it tends to get, a, um, uh, be underappreciated. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Carter, any, any comment on hemochromatosis in terms of- oh, no, I mean, still, obviously in the, the, the pathophysiology, because it's a genetic predisposition to storing iron there. And of course, from the diagnostic criteria. Um, and generally speaking, when one has that genetic predisposition, the most expeditious way to address that really is by, you know, phlebotomy and so forth. But diet modifications um, can be somewhat helpful, and so forth. But yeah, it's um, it, it is one uh, out there that needs to be recognized, um, and it's and it is not always um, picked up. That is correct. Yeah, and I think um, you know what, genetics isn't really part of our model and I'm, I'll show you some statistics on 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 genetics I mean I, I, I respect genetic testing but dr. Trump from you know major disease states stopped doing allele and genetic testing 20 years ago and I think there's a lot of confusion in in, in the gen genomics and genetic testing for example the APOE uh, for allele some people say it's protective in macular disease and you know, um, causative or, uh, you know, exacerbating in Alzheimer's, but we see those two diseases as, uh, as very much on the same continuum. So I think there's some confusion there, but what Dr. Trump showed is when you had the double two and double four, um, and you, you, irrespective of that, the, the work of the, the patients and the treatment being the same, um, both patients would get better. So he, he didn't know why he going to waste his time doing those types of tests. But obviously, there are purely genetic conditions, but I think that's a small percentage. So for, for like in Alzheimer's, familial Alzheimer's is only 2% of the entire population. So the, the, the red bar here is best just showing the overlap. I mean, you often don't express disease unless you can titrate back the risks. And are we measuring risk well? Um, one of the papers that Dr. Trump and I wrote on uh, really looking at Alzheimer's from pre-birth to death is that, you know, where you're born can dictate risk 70 years forward. And that's, that was published by Kaiser Permanente. So, you know, we really need to understand and evaluate risks and work to modify them. But I believe now, like, it took me a while to realize this, but something like diabetes is, is uh, in, in families, Maybe um, you can reverse people if, you, if you're very aggressive and they're buying into it but, it, but from a societal perspective, it may be two generations to kind of reverse these trends and, and create a holistic environment to start reversing this, the, this disease and these trends. And that's, that's the complexity of uh, some of the chronic conditions that we're dealing with. I tell people uh, in general, it, if it took you 20 years to get into a disease state, which it probably did, uh, it's gonna take you 20 months of, of pretty good effort to really get into a state where you have conquered the disease and will avoid recidivism because you've adapted to a new behavioral pattern 
uh, lifestyle and behavioral pattern that will probably keep you in that zone. But if you're looking for a quick hit, you're never going to achieve that in chronic disease. It's just not going to happen. So, you know, the rationale, the difference between acute and chronic, um, one's smoldering, one's, one's burning fire. Uh, today I was talking to someone about, you know, the, the, the easiest way to explain it to some of the participants I work with in corporate wellness plans um, some of them don't even have a high school education, and, and but they're very smart people, is take a pen and, and jab your hand, and you're going to have a very ser serious wound there. But in a couple of weeks, it's pretty much healed up. Now flip the pen or pencil over, take the eraser, and just rub 24-7, you know, um, and nonstop. In three weeks, I guarantee you that chronic eraser inflammation is going to be way worse than the original contusion from from uh, the pen and obviously it's going to cause more damage long term and that's the way we have to think about chronic disease and we don't have that system just some real quick statistics um the cdc says that 90 percent of cost and morbidity and mortality is due to uh, chronic diseases and they say symptoms when when prevention is not possible, managing symptoms when prevention is not possible can reduce these costs. And all I can say to that is, ugh, they don't understand that we're on continuum, that there's no sort of significant transition from pre-diabetes to diabetes or pre-gut dysbiosis to gut dysbiosis, for example. Unless they die, in which case the cost goes to zero. Oh, of course, of course, that's a strategy for sure. So chronic inflammation is long lasting, insidious. And I love this one. Uh, unlike acute inflammation, chronic inflammation um, does not promote healing is basically what they're saying. They're saying it's, it's the cause, but there's always a cause behind um, chronic inflammation, toxicity, Susan, you know, infection. And, and one thing that, that I've read very recently uh, was published in 2017. Think about some of these athletes that are having a hard time getting back in the game because of concussion. You know, if they bang their toe or bruise their knee, they'd be back in in a couple of days. But a guy like Sidney Crosby, you know, one of the best hockey players of all time, missed a year over a two year period because his brain inflammation would not be down regulated. And I think the brain is very different. And so cytokines tend to stay peak um, physiologically in, in the brain compared to other compartments. So even though chronic inflammation usually has a solution um, that will then be ameliorated uh, in most of the terrain, in the brain, it's a little bit a little bit different. And we have to be thinking about not only what caused the inflammation initially, but how we can downregulate the inflammation after the cause has been uh, eradicated. And that's something that um, needs to really is being neglected, I think, in uh, dementia care. And that's why a lot of people are being unsuccessful, even though they're, they're solving the major problems contributing to the disease. Um, Here's a very interesting chart that came in. I think this was the uh, New York Wall Street Journal, uh, obviously a scientific report that they uh, then turn into a nice chart. But even though we have all kinds of interventions for cardiovascular disease, the statin drugs, the blood pressure medication, that from 2016 to uh, 2011, 2016, cardiovascular death rates have gone up by 4.3% and highly elevated double digit in some places considered very healthy, Colorado, Fort Collins, Greeley, Colorado, Colorado Springs. And, you know, a preponderance of these people are on statin drugs. So we presume we're, we're handling it right. Um, here's the president and uh, chairman and CEO of Kaiser Permanente about a year ago, died unexpectedly, November 11th, 2019. You know, died in his sleep. There's a gentleman that has access to all kinds of the top notch healthcare, but, you know, Nobody knew where he was on his health disease continuum for cardiovascular disease until he passed. I mean, they knew he had some minor problems, but they really didn't understand the extensiveness of the problem because of really improper workout, improper assessment of things from a chronic perspective. Um, <clears throat> it's an American problem more than any other problem. 
So we call it the French conundrum, you know, 55 million people that eat the most saturated fat in the world live very long and live very well. Whereas uh, when you look at this chart from the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the US is the outlier. We spend two and a half times more on healthcare and we live two and a half years less than the average of the 35 other developed nations. So it's a significant issue. Oh yeah, this little chart here shows, you know, obviously in America, the more you spend, the shorter you live. That's very clear, very clear statistical co uh, uh, correlation, p-value of 0. 0.000001, guarantee it. Um, you know, some more people have died suddenly, top investment banker, Tim Ross at Meet the Press, um, husband of the founder of Facebook, the CEO of McDonald's. Um, John Warner, bottom left, um, president of the American Heart Association, had a massive heart attack denied by the press initially or the, or the American Heart Association at an American Heart Association uh, conference. That's where he had his heart attack. And then the, uh, the coach for the Biggest Loser contest. I think this is something that people think about incorrectly. They say, why do I want to live so long and be on all kinds of tubes and medications and ambulatory? But this is a study from the National Geographic 2013 May issue called 100 Candles. <clears throat> and it showed they, they went out to search for the, in centenarians, the holy genetic grail and they didn't really find it. They called, you know, they said 25% of longevity is luck. 25% of longevity they were missing besides environmental, you know, food intake and all and good exercise is good measurement. Good measurement to see who's really at risk and understand that risk. But these curves here show that, you know, if you die at 80, you really have 19 years of declining health. Whereas you die at 100, 105, you only have nine years of declining health. So when you look at the asymptote, um, you really have 30 years of healthy lifespan compared to just 20 years of longer life. And so that's really the important thing about um, longevity and improving your health sooner than later. And then here's a, you know, our systems approach. We, we you know, 69,000 ICD codes, ICD-10 codes. We boil it down to four mechanisms, which may not include the hemochromatosis, but we're trying to catch most of it, but poor repair and recovery. It's really malnutrition, excess calories from foods that don't have any nutrients. So you're in a poor repair and recovery state. So that's really the, the metabolic <clears throat> component. Sensitivities and dysbioses in the gut, they cause leaky gut and all kinds of downstream effects from that. Thrive versus survive, you know, we're, we're in a society where we're always in a fight or flight. <clears throat> So we're never in a good repair and recovery rest mode. And then stealth infections tend to come in at the end of this process, take hold and be very refractory to any changes you made in the other three once they take hold. And that's why a lot of people, they've done all kinds of things to improve their life and they're not getting healthier because something, is, something opportunistic has taken hold in their physiology that's really difficult to overcome. So I'm just gonna really talk uh, about our program and how we measure these things, um, and go over some examples. So the first thing is risk. And we've developed, a, you know, we have another survey, right? You know, you, you uh, do a wellness program, you take an HRA, you do a lab panel, you know, get some coaching. <clears throat> so, you know, that's the, that's the romance novel, but we think we've written a better, you know, we have a better author of that romance novel. And so what we do is we give we have, it's 120 questions. It's exorbitant, but you know, the living matrix is 600 questions, you know, that Tom Blue developed at the Institute of Functional Medicine. Um, but we, we get into some, we get into some nitty gritty and the, it's interactive. There's some if then else statements baked into it. But more importantly, we give you a grade overall. Um, the grade is tied to every question answer has a risk score to it. And it's the subjective. And we go through an iterative process with our labs to try to improve the predictability of the risk score related back to the labs. So here's some examples. We, uh, we ask a lot of questions about your teeth. <clears throat> See, uh, you know, 
America has, not only do we have high mortality and high cost, we have some of the highest premature birth rates in the world, 12 and a half percent. Um, the OECD nations are around six and a half percent, so we're at double. And oral, oral pathogens uh, have been very highly connected to premature birth rates. So, you know, and, and why does we have oral pathogens proliferating? Poor repair and recovery from bad nutrients, you know, so it's all connected. And so they're at different levels of the hierarchy. Dr. Carter coins the term the hierarchy of health, but they all are important pieces because there's an opportunity to intervene at these different levels where people are at a, at a point of readiness for change. Um, so here's some more of the questions we ask. We ask a lot of questions about eye and I'll show you on our pathology section about how predictive the eye can be. Um, it's later stage than risks, but it really gives, paints a very interesting picture. Um, the pathology of the eye is very much related to pathology of systems. Um, so here's an example. We use a very simple algorithm. So here's some of the questions we'd ask about implants and root canals. And you can see over here, we have calculated values tied to that that then are used to calculate the, uh, the, group, the group risk factor. So for example, uh, you know, the oral health risk factor, but the overall score, they all contribute uh, the whole connection. So I'm getting a little ahead of my, Self here, but I wanted to show the, the relationship that we published. We published this for a cohort of 70, and now we're publishing the next set of data for a cohort of um, 287. We basically show that we can help people do simple things to modify their risk grade, not heroic things like lose weight, you know, quit smoking. And they've heard that so many times and failed at that, that that's not working for them. So we look at mechanistically. What does smoking do? It's, it's, it's an inflammatory process. What are other inflammatory things in your life that you can embrace changing? <clears throat> and you change those and miraculous things start happening. So what we show is when you lower your overall risk burden, as we measure with a risk grade, which underlying is the score, and we, we have this chronic disease temperature, which I'll get into next, that we see a dramatic improvement in the physiological health measured by this risk score just by changing simple things in lifestyle. And, and that's where we really wanna be in the future is just understanding the risk facets and getting and compelling people to take action so they're not moving down the physiological continuum and the pathology continuum and the disease continuum. So physiology, <clears throat> Once again, we all reside in a health disease continuum. And what we give people is what we call your chronic disease temperature score. And, you know, we were thinking about this, Dr. Carter and I, about is it zero to 10? Is it A to F? You know, and I always as a kid, you know, like, hey, I was a, a B student in middle school. So, you know, I don't mind being a B. I don't, B is good enough, right? No, no, that's not acceptable. Or, you know, I was considered an ugly duckling. So I was never a 10, I was a six, not acceptable. So, but no one wants their child to be above 98.6. So we built a seven point scale based on 98.6 and it's your chronic disease temperature. And what it is, it's an amalgamation of 21 labs that are reasonably predictive for chronic inflammation, chronic health and early mortality risk. It's all based on an early mortality scale. And so what we do is we break that overarching risk factor down for chronic risk and early mortality into different categories because certain markers are much more predictive for say heart disease, BNP, something like that. Whereas insulin is much more predictive for diabetes or, or metabolic disorders. And so we rank each one. I'll show you how we do that. Um, maybe, maybe I'll show you too much. Uh, you tell me if you've seen enough. But then we break it down into categories and color code the individual markers. But all the people on our team, coaches included, are, are trained not to drone over, oh, and your glucose is this, and your A1C is this. They're trained to build a story around the labs. And what we found is we've been very particular about how we rank across the continuum. Well, 
a given lab and how it expresses risk. And it turns out when, when the labs are, are telling the right story, the color coding astonishingly matches up. So for example, very often C-reactive protein, the color that we give for that, the C-reactive protein risk, you know, green being no risk, red and deep red being high risk, matched up with say fibrinogen, uh, insulin levels, glucose levels. So really, it really paints a story of the interconnectivity of these markers and how something as simple as insulin or, or fasting glucose tell you about inflammation in your body as expressed by C-reactive protein. Um, so no one's supposed to be able to read this. Okay, this is my secret sauce. <laughs> but what we did was an exhaustive search of the literature using all different types of searches, which I'll go into in a moment. But here's our raw data. Um, here's the percent of studies linking the association between between a specific marker and specific disease based on the total of all markers for that specific disease, if that makes sense. Comparison of predictive power across all biomarkers and specificity of each test across different disease states. And we spent a lot of time building the analytics to do our best to ferret out the power of a single marker. And a lot of studies try to isolate a marker for predicting a disease. And I think it's, you know, it's a false narrative, but we, you know, that's, that's what researchers get paid to do. It's the, it's the story and it's the constellation, but we're doing the same thing here and trying to isolate a marker and its specificity uh, and precision for um, predicting specific uh, disease outcomes. And, and so it's really pretty simple. We did, we searched markers and diseases in PubMed. We determine the percent association to specific diseases. We search all title markers and diseases that determine connections. And those are the papers we read in, in detail to see how they're associating and risk rating a given marker to the disease. And then we're looking and we're doing searches for tertiles, quartiles, quintiles, and deciles of, of hazard ratios and risk ratios for um, all cause early mortality. And what we found in doing this is that when you look at the tertiles, quartiles, and you start mapping them against specific markers like CRP or, or um, fibrinogen or homocysteine, that they all follow a log linear relationship. And I think that's true, just nature in general. I always tell people, try running a hundred yard dash, okay, and see what you do for a time, or just walk it. You do like 40 seconds. Now to get to 30, it won't take that much effort. But to get to 15 or 12, it's going to take a heck of a lot of effort, the, as the asymptote. And so I think, you know, the asymptote is simply a log linear relationship. And so we look at like the 80th or 90th percentile of a marker for uh, at the upper end of high risk, and then just build a log linear relationship around that um, connected to the, the zone where there's no increase in uh, statistical increase in mortality. And that's how we develop our rating score based on where you are on that log linear scale. So we don't just say, okay, CRP, it's either good or bad. No, every, every elevation in a log linear way above a, a, a baseline no risk level contributes to what we call your chronic disease temperature contribution for that marker. A lot of fudge factors, but you know, look at the Framingham score, pretty useless. Then they add CRP to it and it improves the risk, um, risk of scoring capability of it significantly. And we'll go into a next level. So here, here's the kind of thing that we, we present in our report. So here's what C-reactive protein is. It falls in our inflammation category. Here's the traditional normal range, zero to three. Here's our, in this case, this is for a cancer algorithm, which our risk uh, range is less than 0.6. Uh, milligrams per deciliter. And here's some studies looking at cumulative mortality versus CRP. Um, you know, we don't just use ones that make nice graphical representations of it, but you can see that cumulative mortality goes down a heck of a lot, um, even in the range where it's considered normal. Um, there are many studies that show 
increased risk down to around 0.59 point 0.6 from an all-cause mortality ratio. So we plot these out and try to get multiple studies that give us data like this to allow us to um, determine where the true range is for the no increase in mortality zone. Um, um, what's the um, blue versus red difference here? It says TN plus and TN minus. Um, it looks like that's the difference. What is that? Um, I'll have to look and get back to you, Steve. This is this has been this is something I pulled up a long time ago, so I don't remember exactly what they were trying to refer to in that study. Yeah, because I see ten point five, uh, ten to fifteen in two different places, one red and one blue. Right. So we and, see we see yeah. we see differentiation across that, but I'm not, I I don't recall what that is. This was okay. something I pulled up several years ago, so. My memory is that I'll have to check the inf I'll have to check my TNF alpha in my brain, <laughs> but I don't I don't quite remember. But I'll I'll post that out to you. Um, so here's here's some more data that we include in our report. So papers. This is all for cancer, um, not necessarily just increased uh, mortality risk, but we see. C-reactive protein led to a 12% increase in this particular cancer on a log linear. When we look at it on a log linear basis, um, another one looking at the natural log unit increase for CRP, 16% increase. So these are the kinds of studies that we look at to um, gain our understanding. So this is another piece of education, understanding your labs. Uh, it's, it's about the story. Optimal values is where we see for a biomarker, good statistical studies peer reviewed with no increase in excess early mortality based on sound statistical analysis by someone other than us that, that's published. And then the chronic disease temperature is a single value displayed at the top of your report. It's the combination of excess mortality risk, just, just a basic mathematical assessment based on the hazard ratio for the given biomarker for excess mortality tied to that log linear relationship. So each marker has a slightly different weighting factor based on published hazard ratios for early mortality to make things complicated. Uh, but you know, try to be as exacting as possible. And then we do reporting on before and after. We're looking, you know, it, it makes it easy for the patient. It's almost like you're trying to lose 20 pounds. You're trying to lose two degrees from your chronic disease temperature. You know, that's our initial goal. So it makes it very organic granular for the individual rather than, oh, what was my A1C? What was my GFR? What were all these different markers? No, let's just work on, we're going to pay attention to these, the fine markers, the individual markers, but overall, if you're trending down, you're heading in the right direction. So whatever you're doing, keep doing it. You know, and if you're not making headway by lowering this marker, then we're probably not doing the right thing. Let's reassess our, our, um, our interventional scheme. Um, you know, we do, we do simple educational things like uh, red blood cell distribution with, and the reason why I pull this one up is in our book on, on, um, quarterback and health, how to take and lower your chronic disease temperature. I spent more time looking at red blood cell distribution with, as an example of how we came up with the algorithm than any other marker. And so, you know, RDW really looking at anemia, right? Um, but when you, when you dive down at it, it really is measuring inflammation in the vasculature because a red blood cell three-dimensional disc is actually bigger in diameter than, than a capillary. So it literally has to squeeze through that capillary. And so if the capillary is calcified, inflamed, or otherwise, that's when the red blood cell distribution goes up. And that's pretty well documented. So a little picture of the retina looking at the red blood cells streaming through there and there are actually videos on YouTube of this activity. Um, so here's what RDW is really classically designed for um, anemia but it, it's it's extended to other um, diseases not just of, of the uh, blood cells and this is when you read all 400 papers that have red blood cell distribution width 
in the title of the paper in PubMed, and you look at how they're distributed in terms of what is the major disease indication tied back to the red blood cell distribution width, 15% is mortality all cause, and 42% are talking about some type of cardiovascular disease, and only 11.5% are discussing uh, the association between red blood cell distribution width and, and anemia. So I thought when I originally did that many years ago, I thought that was pretty surprising. And you know, we now you we now have done a lot of correlations between CRP, RDW, fibrinogen, and I think it's a very useful, a very useful marker. And I think it from a from a pictorial perspective for a for a patient, when we talk about this little chart here and what it means in terms of inflation inflammation in your vessels. Most of the people we've discussed this with can relate to that visually and have a little bit of an OMG moment, which is important to get people to move forward with, you know, health interventions. So, um, so here are some typical data. Hopefully, I can answer all the things on this chart, Steve. But um, this is mortality, all cause, um, time to the event versus, you know, different different strata of RDW. So you can see even the 13.6 to 14.5, there's an increase in all cause mortality. And that's of course within the standard of care. So, you know, you don't wanna be within the standard of care. This is smoldering, this is smoldering RDW. This is smoldering vascular inflammation. Um, and that's why we, we have arrived at our ideal range of 11 to 12.5. Not really finding any statistically validated increases in mortality in any of the studies at 12.5 at or below. And so here's another piece of data, a very different, you know, a different study showing that, um, that, that even at, th this is sort of how we arrived at the 12.5 because you see an increase in all cause mortality um, going from, you know, somewhere around 11 and a half to, you know, 12.6. So none of us want to be here. We all want to be here. And that's what it's all about. So mortality rates increased fivefold from the lowest to the highest quintile in this particular study. And uh, uh, Lord knows what, would, what it would be like if they isolated, you know, uh, really, we, we're looking for people um, not 13.7. We're looking for people 15, 16, 18. Below, and below where you really have anemia setting in, really the inflammatory range is like 18 and below, whereas the anemia range is sort of 20 and above, if, if you will. Joseph has a question for you. Go yes, ahead, Joseph. How do you uh, measure the RDW? Well, you know, this is just, this is just LabCorp. This is just a CBC with differential. And, and they give it as a percent. So, so that means doing... in my... Uh, <clears throat> annual physical or whatever we call it nowadays, I get these results and I just don't, I just never looked for it or do I have to request it? it you know, it, sometimes, sometimes Joe, some labs are dropping off RDW from the CBC with differential. Uh, not always, a uh, lab or with the one I do, cause you know, you're, there are many white blood cell count type orders you can place, but the one we do includes the RDW. So um, it, it should be out there and it's, you know, it's an important, it's a very important, you know, it's, it's not the one test by itself, it's the corroboration. So when you see an elevated RDW and elevated C-reactive protein, then we're no longer guessing about, you know, vascular inflammation, you know. So whereas C-reactive protein, a Q-phase reactant, you bang your toe, you can have a little inflammation in your toe C-reactive protein goes up, it's settling down. RDW is 11.5, 12. We probably know that that's not a case of vascular inflammation. That was an acute, an acute event that triggered that. And okay. I'll, show you, I'll show you the data we use on that as well. So here's something as simple as triglycerides. You know, 150 standard of care. We want you to be between 40 and 80. And a study like this shows you that you know, you want to be 50 to 60. You don't want to be 100. You don't want to be 150. 
if you want uh, if you want to reduce your relative risk of heart disease from the Framingham study. So um, here's one that was published in 2005. Um, Women's Health Initiative, a Women's Health Study, uh, what is it? Uh, Women's Health Initiative, Nurses Health Study. Did I get the, sometimes I get those backwards, but 136,000 women. Very simple thing. Now this is relative statistics, but I'll use relative statistics to make my case, just like the standard of care does to make their case for statin drugs or whatever. But it's very simple. You take two women, two groups of women, 4,700, 6,700, follow them for six years, 50% more of these are dead. It may be a small number total from an absolute perspective, but to those women, it's important. But more importantly, that should be what the, you know, 6.7 should not be normal if your mortality risk goes up. And so the standard of care now is 3.4 to 10.8, and our value is 4.0 to 5.8. There are studies that show statistical increase in cancer mortality at a white blood cell count, total white blood cell count of 5.8. And of course, the differential is extremely important too, but I find based on the studies we've done with our cohorts, not huge cohorts, but important cohorts that white blood cell count alone without even looking at some of the differentiation is very predictive in a lot of cases. There are, there are some cases where it'll be misleading um, just a pure white blood cell count because certain things will lower it, certain things will raise it. And when they're working together, you can have competing factions and it winds up in the middle. Whereas you actually had two processes that were adverse that put it in the middle. Um, so we're just talking about those values. So here's, here's another study from not the Women's Health Initiative, but you know, less than, less than 5.7, there's your all-cause mortality. Um, what is this, all cancer mortality rate. And there's where I get the 5.8 for cancer. So less than 5.7, the, the rate is uh, 23.4 deaths per 100,000, whereas at 5.8 to 6.8, 31, that's a pretty big increase from a pretty low, um, you know, at a, at a number that most doctors would sign off and say, hey, we don't even have to look at white blood cell counts, they're way, way within normal, uh, not so much. So that's a 32% uh, increase in cancer mortality just from going from less than 5.7. And probably it's not gonna be at, at, at 4,000 or 3,500. It's gonna be somewhere in, may say less than equal to 5.7. It's probably, you know, 4.5 to 5.7, that kind of range. And this is what it looks like when you, when you graph it out um, graph out those numbers. Significant trend and in increase in cancer mortality. And you know, most things follow a J curve or a U curve. Yeah, I remember when, you know, in uh, Malcolm Kendrick, doctoring, da doctoring Data, his book, you know, he talked about some of the pundits saying it, it's, a, it's a linear, it's a linear curve and the lower the better for blood pressure. And that's obviously silly. It's, you know, it's, that's a J curve as well. Much more of a J curve than a U curve. You're much worse off on the low end than you are on the high end in so many cases. And so this is some of the data that we, we grab. Um, so there's the standard of care range for white blood cell counts. And, and you know, there's our range. We're really trying to optimize. But anywhere outside of that green, the mortality is going up. Um, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. That's out of the complete blood count, but no one calculates it. I would say neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio is your most sensitive of the innate immune response molecules. Um, this is pretty generalizing, but neutrophils go up with bacteria, lymphocytes go down with viruses. So the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio is sort of your bacterial viral burden, uh, you know, an amplified signal. And so uh, that there's my amplified signal thing, you know, RCA Victor. Uh, so some neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio uh, things, you know, 1.9 to 2.4, pretty high mortality. And that's not a very high level. That's not a very high ratio. You know, we're seeing five, six, things of that nature, 
aren't even really plotted on this chart. Um, so here's uh, poor survival in breast cancer patients, uh, NLR less than three, NLR greater than three. And the overall survival rate is significantly different. And you know, to me, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio is a modifiable risk factor. You know, treat the virus, treat the bacteria, improve your diet, make changes, and you're probably gonna improve that neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. And if you do, statistically, you've improved, your, you've improved your prognosis or improved your odds of even getting a disease like this. And it's, it's as highly correlated to cardiovascular disease as it is to cancer, maybe even more so. Um, I'm not showing these, but this is a professional, you know, a scientist at Dana-Farber who talks about the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. And what he basically says is, if your NLR is high, your overall survival um, with chemotherapy is extraordinarily low. So like if your NLR is four or more, four or more you should not get chemo. That's a death sentence. You know, it's as simple as that. PFS and OS go off the charts when the NLR goes up. Um, I just throw this in here sort of in the middle of things because, you know, we're looking at acute phase reactants. But um, the beauty about the acute phase reactants, they all have different half-lives. So like if C-reactive protein is up, is it just something acute that happened? But if fibrinogen is up too, haptoglobin, uh, SAA, different half-lives, then you can start making speculations without second, second test. You know, it's better to test you know, multiple times every, every three months or so. But when fibrinogen correlates with C-reactive protein and the half-life is very different, then I know we probably have a chronic, a chronic situation going on. It's not, it's not a perfect correlation, but, you know, it's, an, it's another piece of data to consider when, when evaluating a marker that's an acute phase reactant for chronic health. Said rate, you know, uh, Dr. Carter presented to the, uh, the Black Health Trust um, advisory board a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about some of these markers, and there were 10, 12 doctors on, and, and, and one brave doctor spoke up and said, you know, yeah, we used to run these markers. He says, I don't know why we don't run them anymore. And then another doctor chimed up and said, yeah, well, we don't really know what to do with these markers anymore. <laughs> you know, what, what I find is said rate is my best simple physiological marker for what's going on in your gut. Is it perfect for that? No. But, you know, what I really say to my population, um, you know, with a little grain of salt, but I don't tell them I have a grain of salt in it is, you know, every cell in your body is a little battery. Like I was an electric chemist uh, at, at MIT, my degrees in, in chemistry. So a redox chemist is really my, uh, my stock and trade and everything in the body is electrical. And when a red blood cell settles quickly, and that's what the said rate is, it's a measure of how much the red blood cells settle and separate from the clear plasma over the course of an hour measured in millimeters. It's really, that when they don't settle, they're defying gravity. Why? Because they have a little charge on them. So they're repelling each other to, to some extent and that's holding them um, in separation. So it's obviously a stroke risk and things of that nature. Here's some data, apparently healthy men. You know, when someone has a set rate of uh, 95, they're not apparently healthy, you know? So um, I find that set rate with when said rates up, that's the marker of high complexity in terms of what's going on with an individual. And the reason why I say it's tied to gut is because you look at the sodium and potassium pump, and then you look at gut dysbiosis and lack of absorption of minerals that contribute to that sodium potassium pump. And I think that's, that's where we see the said rates start rising when you don't have, um, when you have, don't have good mineral homeostasis in your blood. Um, this is, you know, my wife worked in Mohs surgery and, you know, every one of the doctors and their kids had 
psychological, neurological problems. They never got vitamin D. They never went out in the sun. They're always covered. And I like this chart here. I show it because there's so much selection bias in all kinds of research because you know the researchers make their stake and trade on research. Um, <clears throat> but this is just CDC all-cause mortality from cancer versus NASA, how much light is hitting the surface of the earth. And there's a very interesting correlation where people treasure their skin and cover up. Where you got you guys in Silicon Valley? Uh oh, high mortality. Go out and get some sun. Don't worry about wrinkles. You need the vitamin D and every other nutrient that's produced on your on the surface of your skin. And then the Florida, yeah, they're older, but they're also covering up. And then here we are in the middle of the country where it's a combination of outdoor activities and good sunlight keeps the cancer rates um, under control. So what do I say when the cancer deaths go up and the sun goes down? AIP, you know, I'm, I, I really try to avoid doing lipids, but the Arthrogenic Index of Plasma published in the Mayo Proceedings by a group from Johns Hopkins. And it's simply the log of the ratio of um, the triglycerides over a high density uh, HDL. And how I explain that to my cohort is triglycerides is your surrogate for you know, short-term carbs, you know, sugar, sugar and low and high glycemic index carbs. And HDL is a surrogate for recycling of excess healthy fats. So when, you're, when your HDL is low, you don't have a lot of fats in your system. When your triglycerides are high, you have a lot of sugars in your system. And guess what? AIP goes up. So it's a very simple measure, but it's actually... Um, has some correlations, you know, it's, it's actually more predictive than any of the lipids in terms of uh, mortality change. This is for studying elderly people in that Mayo Clinic uh, proceeding, so people 65 and older. Um, but the AIP is actually a surrogate for uh, uh, LDL particle size. So you don't have to do the fancy Framingham or, uh, um, uh, yeah, is it the uh, frame? Are you IQ? Or NMR. Yep. Yeah, Tom, could you go back to the cholesterol slide and review it a little bit? We did have a question in the chat about uh, cholesterol. So, it, for example, mortality change, 11% reduction with a cholesterol above 200, which is exactly opposite from what people have been um, told yeah. in the marketplace. I'm going to go over cholesterol, but I think there's a, there's a lot of selection bias in the the cholesterol data, and I think if you look, I've written a lot about this, not in a very organized fashion, but when you look at good studies that lack bias, you'll find that your ideal position um, for cholesterol is around 220. And obviously that's, a, that's an aggregate of HDL, LDL, and, and, and free cholesterol, but 220 is really the marker, and I'll show that in a little bit, but, um, you know, particularly in the elderly, as we suffer, and this is a, a study in 65 year old and older people. And this is published by Johns Hopkins and Mayo Clinic Proceedings, you know, recently. So basically immunosenescence, we start, our white blood cells aren't as efficient, our adaptive immunity isn't efficient. So we have what I call a tertiary immunity. And that's one of the little books I wrote. And anybody wants to read these books, just send me a link and uh, send me an email and I'll send you a PDF to that page where I have PDFs of these books. But, you know, tertiary immunity is extraordinarily important. Amyloidosis, the amyloid, the unfolded proteins, I'll show that in a bit. They're protective in many cases. Cholesterol is a repair. It's involved in cell membrane formation and repair and recovery. So if your, your lipids are low, particularly your free cholesterol, your overall mort or mortality goes up. Now, there's a conundrum with statin drugs. Every drug before statin and every drug after statin lower LDL, but do not, but they've been a disaster for physiological health chronic diseases. The reason why statin drugs confer some type of benefit and LDL goes down is they're pleiotropic. They work by multiple facets. They lower, 
the production of CoQ10 in the enzyme in the, in the liver. They lower the production of LDL in the liver, but they're also antibiotics. And this is actually well published. Go look at, go, go, to, go to Scholar Google and, and keyword search for, they never call them antibiotics, but anti-infective, antimicrobial, anti-XYZ. So when you look at the underlying cause of heart disease, this is a, a major mechanism in infectious inflammatory processes. So that's why statins work at a very small level in a certain cohort, not in older people to be sure. But the Zocor study, you know, 55 year old people, 51 year old people, when you do the absolute statistic number to treat on statin drugs, it's, it's, it's around 1% effect, but they advertise 20% relative statistic you know relative statistic does not save your life the only thing that really is meaningful to your health is an absolute statistic so uh, i'll give you another example steve uh, schmitz a friend of mine medicinal scientist for warner lambert he was on the um development of lipitor before pfizer bought them and when dr trump told me you know statins are similar to macrolides or antibiotic i go to steve i said steve you're on the Pfizer development team. Are statins, statins are antibiotic, aren't they? And he goes, yeah, we know that. So, you know, do you think you could be given a, an antibiotic for life in a current culture about antibiotics? The answer is no. But you can be given a lipid lowering drug for life. So, um, hopefully I, I answered that a little bit. Um, you know, so here's, here's something the, the head of outreach, educational outreach for Harvard got three very, very, very nasty letters from me and a phone call because this article I used to help people get off statin drugs for years, published in 2007. And about four months ago, I said, I have a sneaking suspicion that this is too good to be true, this article. And so I downloaded the PDF. And then I was doing a consult with someone. I said, let me, all you have to do is Google Harvard brain cholesterol. And you'll see what Harvard really talks about in terms of how important cholesterol is. And we did it and it didn't come up. I said, oh, you're searching wrong. And I looked and they took the article down. And that's when I wrote to the guy and said, you know, you're a criminal uh, for taking an article this good down and tell me, Tell me how your vision has changed on, on this. So cholesterol is essential for human health. It's the building block of steroid hormones, including stress hormones, cortisol, so on and so forth. And it's not just another pretty molecule holding the cells together. It's crucial in cell functioning and allowing chemicals to pass into and out of cells. So it's an extraordinarily, you know, 25% of your cholesterol is in your brain and your brain is only two and a half percent the mass of your body. So there's, there's 10 times more cholesterol in your brain. Why? Because the brain wants to kill itself? Now, if you want to eat a food highest in cholesterol, anybody want to guess what that food would be? Raw eggs. Any other animal brain. Uh. Because they all, they all concentrate cholesterol because your brain is so metabolically active, it's going undergoing a lot of repair and recovery. It's all lipid. So there's where your cholesterol is. So anyway, um, I, I'm talking a little bit about, so here's a, here's a study where <coughs> published in neurology, no cardiologist read it, but people had an LDL of 50 to 90, 50 to 69, had a 65% higher risk of hemorrhagic blood vessel bursting. Why? Because you don't have the cholesterol to repair that tissue at, as it's undergoing wear and tear life happens. And then below 50, the risk is nearly tripled. And of course, the American College of Cardiology wants you to be, be in the 50 to 69 range and have a 65% higher risk of hemorrhagic stroke. So, you know, that's just the LDL piece. And then here's the thing I showed you before is that heart disease rates are going up, yet cholesterol is coming down. So, Here's some statistics. I'm not going to run through this, but the Japanese study that shows that 200 to 220 is optimal. Um, you know, and 
on the low end is, is particularly bad. You know what the number one cause of death is when your cholesterol goes low? You kill yourself. Violent deaths because your brain is inflamed. It's not repairing and recovering and it's a mess. So just, I'm not gonna really dive into this because I wanna get into the eye. Here's a huge chart, 164 nation study on cholesterol um, and some of the different things from communicable diseases to cardiovascular events, so on and so forth. But the one I like the best is the next one. Um, so I'm, I'm whipping through this. So here's not the next one yet, but this is um, two very astute MD and MD PhD at uh, UCSF. And they basically say changes in lipids and lipoproteins that occur during inflammation and infection are part of the innate immune response. So if your cholesterol is 250, don't, don't reduce it. Find out why you're, you have inflammation. Where's your CRP? Where's your SED rate? What's your LDH? What's your CK? What's all these other markers? Homocysteine, um, uric acid, things like that. Well, so lipids play a role in protecting our bodies from inflammation and infection. Measuring cholesterol misses risk caused by inflammation and infection. Um, so, and this is all from the UCSF paper. So here's my favorite one. Why? Because I, I put it together. It's very simple. So here's um, CDC, kind of a gross curve of uh, total cardiovascular disease deaths going back to 1900. And here's sort of smoking rates in our American population. And then here's a little factoid. This is when statins were first introduced, 1987. And right around here, they were seeing very wide use. But if you project on the trajectory of smoking trends and project the dotted red line of where cardiovascular mortality rates were going, when you add statin drugs, the relative rate went up based on the change that was occurring. So, you know, and then here's from UCLA. Almost 75% of heart attack patients, and this was a study of 150,000 people, fell within recommended targets for LDL cholesterol, 75%. And you, of course, this article suggested that we need to lower the numbers. But then, you know, the, <laughs> right, Steve? But then the hemorrhagic stroke goes through the roof. But at least they didn't die of a heart attack. So the statin was obviously working. So I hope that to the person asking about cholesterol has a little bit better picture of, of this, that what we're being told and the reality of it are really two very disjointed stories tied to demonizing LDL and cholesterol. And I would say cholesterol may be the most important molecule in our physiology, if I had to pick one, you know, I mean, it, it's not 95%, but like, it, it's up there. It's up there. Um, so just to sort of summarize, the chronic disease temperature is an amalgamation of all these markers into a single score using the kind of analytics that we're talking about here that we did. And so, um, it's reflecting all 2021 20, markers. And our goal is to measure it, measure your physiology accurately and help you find ways to lower it and improve it. Um, so next I'm gonna talk about sort of the last topic. I see where we have plenty of time, but the next of the continuums, we have the risk continuum, they all overlap. The physio so when your risks perpetuate, then your physiology will start getting bad. When your physiology is bad for a long period of time, then we'll start seeing pathology changes. And then when pathology crosses some artificial line, we call that disease. So my mentor at Harvard, um, Dr. Trump, ophthalmologist, and like I said at the preamble, he stopped looking at eye diseases as an isolation in 1980. 
and developed methodologies to do a better workup and patient treatment for people with eye diseases and comorbid diseases along with it. And with that, most of the lab work I told you in the interpretation, he did. I mean, he didn't do it the way we did it, but he knew it implicitly. He knew that the reference ranges were wrong. He knew what markers to look at and he interpreted them appropriately and uh, you know, put me on a path to understand where to look to really understand, you know, to build a very robust, simple and expensive uh, testing protocol for people. So um, what do we have here? So, you know, eye disease connections uh, known, but just not implemented. Eye and systemic disease, the eye and pediatric systemic disease, ocular syndromes and systemic diseases, color atlas of the eye and systemic disease, or retina, the approachable part of the brain. And then the book that Dr. Trump and I wrote, we put a lot of effort into chapter six, which is the connection between the eye, systemic diseases and Alzheimer's. And I'll go over some of that today. Um, John Dowling, chair professor at Harvard in ophthalmology. And you know, ophthalmology comes under it at Harvard under surgery. You know, so like they're all the ophthalmologists are surgeons. They're not really clinicians solving deep rooted problems. Um, the retina provides an excellent source of material for detailed anatomical, physiological and pharmacological analysis of neural me mechanisms in the vertebrate brain. And that's what Dr. Trump did. So um, here's uh, an article that, you know, there aren't many like this, you know. I haven't seen an article yet that says a sick brain and a sick body for Alzheimer's, you know. And that's an article that Dr. Carter and I should publish at some point. But here's one, sick eye and a sick body, systemic findings in patients with primary open ankle glaucoma. Glaucoma is not a disease of pressure. It's a disease of inflammation, pressure is secondary. Um, and then, Joseph, here's your, here's your quote, human being is part of the whole called by us the universe, a part limited in time and space, Albert Einstein. That, this is how the eye relates to things, but I think hopefully I'm gonna show you folks some things you haven't seen before. I know uh, a lot of you understand the essence of the labs I've been talking about and simple risk, but so here's, I was giving a talk to a functional medicine group almost three years ago now, and it was on a Sunday, and this article appeared on like a Friday, and a friend of mine sent it to me, a New York Times Well blog, Ebola's legacy, children with cataracts. And so what it said in the tagline is cataracts usually afflict the old, but doctors in Africa have been shocked to find them in Ebola survivors as young as five. That unfolded protein response, that amyloid is part of the innate immune response to uh, Ebola infection in the eye. So there it is, cataract plain as day. And if you look at this article, tons of cataract surgeries done on 20 year olds in, in Sub-Saharan Africa that where Ebola was uh, epidemic. But so, you know, you're supposed to tell them what, tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them and then tell them what you told them. I'm here to tell you that a cataract <clears throat> is a barometer for infection, either systemic or local. Here we have a young child with a local acute infection, Ebola. But if you take two people, one six, two 60, 60 year old and one has a cataract and one doesn't, I guarantee you with the proper analytics, I can find a chronic inflammatory or subacute chronic infection in that individual. And that's what Dr. Trump's 40 year career was running white blood cell counts and interpreting them properly, running C-reactive protein, running homocysteine, running uric acid, running you know, uh, fibrinogen, looking for chlamydophilia pneumoniae, looking for Lyme disease, looking for some of these infectious processes, looking for toxoplasma gondii, which can scar the eye and cause all kinds of brain complications, not just in pregnant, not just in fetuses developing uh, you know, in pregnant women. We're worried about cat feces and toxoplasma gondii. I have a question for you, Tom, Yes. Um, about the cataracts and Ebola. One of the uh, findings that have been made in terms of looking at the Ebola um, virome is that it's got a, um, a selenium coding um, repeat. I think it's a UGA repeat. 
um, in the virome and that when that gets um, transcribed into protein, it's basically dropping the selenium reserves of the host precipitously um, in a fairly rapid manner. And I know that cataracts is also an oxidative stress condition that, and that selenium is a powerful antioxidant. So I'm wondering if you've ever run across any connection between selenium status and cataracts. I wish Dr. Trump was alive to answer that question. He would know the answer to that. I, I unfortunately um, don't. I mean, and the reason why we correlate acute infection, maybe not necessarily selenium is because of the, the connection between chronic, but uh, all I can tell you is selenium is a very strong antioxidant and, and it's uh, K. Barry Sharpless at the MIT, then he went to Stanford, was uh, ran a project where they were injecting small amounts of selenium into sheep and it was markedly improving the coat quality of the wool of the sheep. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Dr. Carter, you want to talk about selenium? Well, I mean, but it also has very strong antiviral and anti-tumor properties. Yes. So, yeah. The antiviral stuff is what I've been running across. And that there, there are certain regions in Africa where the selenium level in the soil is marginal, but the natives that still follow the, the native lifestyle mm -hmm. collect the gabon nuts and, and make a kind of um, gabon nut butter, which they dose in small quantities throughout the year. And those um, I think 50% of those people who do that are actually immune to Ebola. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. And again, so, you know, just like we're all very, you know, deficient in zinc and vitamin D and magnesium and a whole host of things, we're also deficient in selenium. So, um, yeah, this is an important nutrient that, you know, we put in our protocol for immune support as well. Susan, on, on the... Um your, your website, there was a speaker that talked about, have we lost that animal instinct? I'm gonna to have to watch that video because you know, how, how do they know that? And you know, we don't have a clue about our environment anymore. And even, on, even our personal environment, we've completely lost touch with it. Well, it's a six hour video, but what he, <laughs> and, and, but, and what he says basically, the premise, which is also written in his book, I also interviewed him on a radio show, but the premise is that the animals instinctively know to graze in the area that has the nutrients they need. And he also says children, before they get fed the crappy diet, also have that same instinct. And the animals, before they're fed an adulterated diet, that when they get that bad diet, they no longer have it. And another interesting thing he mentioned is a woman that had a cardiac transplant when, excuse my dog squealing, when she had the cardiac transplant, her diet went from a healthy one to desiring the beer or any unhealthy thing uh, the original owner of the heart had. Those are two very interesting things he said and uh, highlights for me. Well, I was mentioning that at the beginning that I've come to the realization recently that this is going to, some of these chronic diseases are going to be generational problems. It's going to be very, very complex. But, you know, some of the things that make me realize that we, we listen to Big Brother way too much is salt. You know, salt, you need salt for your brain to function. You need potassium, you need potassium to balance it, but we need salts. And, and people are eschewing salt. They're fearful of salt. Does that matter on your aldosterone to renin level? Well, I mean, that, that can play a role, especially in an African-American population. So one may have to be a little more careful with that. But, you know, using like Celtic sea salt and, you know, um, the Himalayan pink salt that has the additional nutrient components to it, um, then there's generally not a worry about that. But again, you know, everyone is still individualistic. So uh, that can be, you know, looked at in more detail. But for the most part, yeah, most people generally do not have to restrict salt. And when, they're, when you're saying restricting salt, just like a Morton's table salt, which actually has really no nutrient value at all. This is, this is what we do. And, you know, Bob Shearer wrote the... Um, Mail newsletter for 14 years. And I was telling him about this potassium sodium concoction we put together. And he said, you know, unless your kidneys are really failing, I think he said a creatinine of six or something, 
can't remember the exact number, but he said, you don't have to worry about excess potassium, but we still are cautious, but you can get potassium chloride, no salt, but the potassium uh, gluconate is very mild in flavor. So what I do is I take like a dead sea salt or a Himalayan salt and mix about a third of this potassium uh, gluconate in it. So I have potassium and it, it, it's amazing how when you have the right balance of sodium and potassium, you don't get thirsty. Um, I have a suggestion for you too. If you ever have a client who appears to be having a problem with potassium that you can check their um, uh, uh, cellular potassium in addition to just looking at serum potassium and that when people have a low metabolic rate, they become potassium over utilizers. So if you're only looking at, at serum potassium, you can misinterpret what their actual potassium status is. Absolutely. And one of my clients was driven into cardiac failure by being put on an IV drip when, when he was actually a potassium overutilizer. I see, yeah. Yeah, I do micronutrient tests on a vast majority of my patients. So looking at red blood cell and white blood cell, you know, attributes of those nutrients. So that's a, yeah, that's a great test. Yeah, so potassium, the correlation of potassium, serum potassium with total potassium status is excellent in young, healthy men. <laughs> 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 so let me just, um, I'll go back to the, uh, the amyloid and the, the cataract and age-related macular disease. So this is the ARID study, age-related eye disease study, 11 centers, 4,500 people. And what they basically showed is that um, age-related eye disease is deadly. So if you look at these statistics over here, um, compared to prostate cancer, no comparison, really the mortality rate for uh, macular disease and cataract is about the same as for breast cancer. And I always say, it, who's been on a macular disease walk? Who's been on a cataract walk? And of course, it's, it's an absurd statement uh, from a cultural perspective, but from a risk perspective, it's, it's, it's right on the money. And this is, it's not just a single study. So since this study has been done, there are now 17 studies around the world that show a correlation between cataract formation in younger, younger people, relatively speaking, and early mortality. Now, uh, Kerry Gelb, a really good optometrist, head of the All Docs OD, did a documentary that unfortunately was somewhat scuttled by COVID. It was coming out party was supposed to be at Javits in, in March, but he did uh, a survey of centenarians who had cataracts and there was two women and a, and a man in Costa Rica, and they did successful cataract surgery on them and restored their vision. But at that point in time, when you're 100 years old, you have this tertiary immunity going on, the amyloidosis really protecting your, your body. This, I'm sure he has amyloid all over, not just in the eye, but the, the really cool thing is Carrie's a strapping 45-year-old guy, and this guy was a skinny little guy from Costa Rica, and Kerry wanted to be a, a, a ball player for the New York Yankees. And the 102 year old man challenged him to a wood splitting contest. And Kerry was very awkward with that ax and the 102 year old was wielding it like he knew what the heck he was doing because he did. Um, so, but so cataract is not a death sentence but if you're at, at 60 years old and you have cataract forming, that's, that's a sign of something going on. Uh, the cool thing about the ARID study, yes, Joseph. Uh, you, you went through the previous slide on the prostate cancer too fast. Can you go back and maybe spend a few seconds on? Uh... I, I wasn't really talking about the prostate cancer. I was just using it as a statistic. Um, the five-year survival rate for men with prostate cancer is nearly 100%. Uh, the relative 10-year survival rate is 98%. Whereas, and then breast cancer is 91% in five years. But in... If you have macular disease diagnosed, your, your survival is only 89% in six and a half years. So it's similar to, um, to breast, breast cancer. cancer. So it's much more deadly than prostate cancer, much okay. more deadly. Okay. So the beautiful thing about people who can do eye testing, and my son just started practicing as an optometrist, he just graduated 
is that they can see things that other doctors just can't see. Um, so here's a correlation between the ARID study for mortality rate for um, age-related macular disease, and we can see the pathology. This is Drusen. It's actually uh, 142 beta amyloid, according to Don Anderson's research at UC Santa Barbara. Um, this is blood. This is a broken blood vessel. This is a hemorrhagic mini, mini stroke in the back of the eye. So that's why you have high mortality. You know, if you're having strokes in the back of your eye, where else are you having strokes? So, um, you know, that's where Dr. Trump would say, I feel sorry for the doctors. I can see the disease. And you can see the response. You know, he would treat a disease like this with um, anti-inflammatory and anti-infectives if it called for it based on the, um, based on the blood labs. And he would see, you know, he, he always argued with Judah Folkman about Avastin versus minocycline as an anti-angiogenesis uh, drug. And uh, minocycline in a uh, sub-antibiotic level would generally clear up these vessels. Um, you know, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Smith, just sent me another article on, hey, the eye might portend Alzheimer's. Well, this was a 2003 study in Lancet that shows that a specific type of cataract is highly correlated to the beta-142 amyloid plaque in the brains. And this was an autopsy study. And they showed, they looked at the, 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 the fluid in the brain, the fluid in the eye, it matched for the, for the amyloid prepolymers and the extent was very similar. And so when there was a lot of this type of cataract, there was a lot of amyloid in the brain, very highly correlated. And of course, I always ask the question, why didn't Harvard in 2003 start screening every patient coming into Mass General Brigham's and Beth Israel for Alzheimer's? And they're still mucking around forming a company to do Raman spectroscopy to measure the amyloid as an analytical tool where they've missed a huge opportunity for early detection of potential Alzheimer's disease. But the cataract in this case is not the nuclear cataract tied to the studies I showed previously, but this is called a supranuclear or cortical cataract. And most ophthalmologists and optometrists just observe them because they're in the cortex and they don't affect central vision. So they're just quote unquote observed. But what they really should be observing is the neurodegeneration happening in that individual, but it's pretty clear. Um, this is a fibril of the 142 beta amyloid done by some pathologist in an autopsied brain. And you know, they have to work very hard in the staining and the sectioning to get this image. And here's a picture um, using a, a slit lamp microscope. It's in most optometry offices, knowing how to use a slit lamp microscope, increasing intensity and narrowing the beam and exposing this 142 beta amyloid fibril in the, the cortex of the lens. Um, it doesn't just happen out of the blue, just like heart disease, you know, you don't die fatally from a heart attack unless something led to it. So there are instruments all on the continuum. The first one is uh, looking at coma aberration. The first early swelling of the lens, where it's kind of like putting oil on water, you see the oil spread out, you can see the refraction. Um, then pseudo exfoliation is early amyloid aggregation, then the fibril then spokes, and then a full-blown cortical cataract. Most people don't survive to this stage. They really truly have Alzheimer's at this stage. So it's a, it's a progression. It's, guess what? It's a continuum, right? Um, this is OCT, uh, an OCT printout. OCT is tomography, just like MRI. The only thing is OCT is extraordinarily more precise because MRI is using large waves and OCT using invisible light, very small waves. And the resolution is tied to the wavelength of the light, the interference that's created with the tissue. So OCT can see very, very detailed structures. And that's why I, I try to get someone, you know, I don't need to do the eye testing, but if they're really concerned about neurodegeneration, um, we look at the risks, we look at physiology, but we look at the pathology. We can see if there is a change in the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness very accurately with this tomography technique. 
and you can see both thickness and volume. And so here's a case of a very healthy eye. And I won't tell you who this is, but it's a very famous um, um, health promoter. Um, here's an eye with uh, where we have uh, one eye is seeing, Dr. Trump always used to say the beautiful thing about the difference between what I do with eyes compared to the brain is you have one brain, but you have two eyes. And there's statistically a very strong correlation between the migration of a disease like cataract or macular disease from the good eye, the, the infected eye, affected eye to the so-called fellow eye. And in macular disease, it's like 22% in one year, 85% in five years. And so with those statistics, you can tell how good your treatment is. Because if you don't have migration from the infected eye to the clean fellow eye at 22% in a year, you are outperforming standards. Um, so something as simple as that can be used statistically to measure outcome. But here we're just looking at uh, so-called clock hours, looking at the thickness of the retinal nerve fiber layer versus standards. And these are all age matched. So if a 20 year old gets an OCT, they're matched up against the thickness of uh, other 20 year olds and so on and so forth. So it's a very accurate test. Um, here's Chris Christopherson, you know, presumed to have Alzheimer's then they said, no, no, you have Lyme disease and, and no one's connecting the dots. It's, it's, the, it's the same thing, but his OCT was whacked. Um, here's a study, uh, Barisha is Dr. Trump's team looking at the thickness of the, that retinal nerve fiber layer um, versus diseases. So as we go down in thickness, we see an increase in glaucoma and, and Alzheimer's disease. So it's a very strong correlation between the thickness of this retinal nerve fiber layer and path, neurodegenerative pathologies. And Steve, if you want the slide deck, I'll put it up on my site and, and give you access to it. But, it, you know, cool. just the, the, the other continuum aspect is, you know, Dr. Trump and I published in our paper on causation of Alzheimer's that depression is a risk indicator for future Alzheimer's disease. And all the mood disorders, they're, they're, they're low grade inflammatory in healthy individuals, relatively healthy, robust individuals, whereas Alzheimer's is generally a disease of, of older people less resilient. Go ahead, Joseph. So uh, when you are dealing with uh, ocular hypertension and the doctor prescribes eye drops, you're not really solving the problem. You're just solving the symptoms. 100, I can't go over hundred percent, but you know, if you want to have a discussion on glaucoma and eye diseases in the absence of Dr. Trump, it would be Dr. Carter because he has uh, you know vast experience on cause and effect for glaucoma. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, patients with bipolar disorder have thinning retinal nerve fiber layer. We had a lady, she was 41 years old, executive assistant to the CEO of a Fortune 1000 company, had migraines since she was 18. Okay, she was 41, taking four medications now every day high dose Excedrin, beta blockers, things like that. Her OCT was, was off. She was already experiencing neuro, earliest signs of neurodegeneration. So when you think about who's gonna develop MS at a young age or have early onset Alzheimer's that's not familial, this, this is the kind of person who's gonna have it. And we did a very detailed workup on her and, and got her out of her migraines for the first time in her life. Unfortunately, we were at a corporate wellness program and. We were only afforded three months of treatment, but we, you know, we did pretty outstanding work for her in that period of time. Um, so depression, bipolar disorder. Um, did I have the depression one here? Um, yeah, I, I took that slide out, but depression is highly or correlated to it too. Just because I have to put this here, it has no real relationship to any of the simple tests you do an eye. But the next big thing in the drug development would be the, the um, anti-hyperphosphorylation of tau. But when you look at tau in nature, once again, Susan, we learned from nature is animals that hibernate 
hyperphosphorylate their tau and then they reverse it. So I believe that hyperphosphorylation in Alzheimer's patients is a energy conservation protection mechanism, just like the amyloid is. The amyloid by uh, Robert Moyer at Harvard is sh was shown to be an antimicrobial peptide, part of the innate Im immune response. But no one's using the eye. A GDX machine can measure hyperphosphorylation of tau protein very accurately because they make up the, the uh, very uniform microtubules. And when the microtubule, when you hyperphosphorylate, they lose their, uh, their uh, uniformity. And um, when they're uniform, they polarize light. When they lose their uniformity, they lose their ability to polarize it, and that's easily detectable. So you can see hyperphosphorylization uh, in the back of the eye with instruments. So chronic disease status, <coughs> not, I'm not going to talk about that much. We're, we're kind of wrapping up, show a couple of case studies. But what I like, this is from Kaiser Peterson. And here we are in 2020, and the largest percent occurrence of chronic conditions, the number one chronic condition from cost, morbidity, and mortality is ill-defined. Cardiovascular, circulatory diseases are second. And uh, then I show up a couple of my mentors who I never got a chance to meet, but uh, Claude Bernard, the original medical scientist, but MD scientist, so the experiment doesn't know what he's looking for, will not understand what he finds. Sorry, it's a little sexist back then in 1865, but uh, with all due respect to the female members of the um, audience. But this is just a uh, name of a paper, the second thing. So Dr. Trump, you know, was a medical nerd. He'd wake up Sunday with journals on his chest because that's what he, he went to bed Saturday night reading journals. That was fun, fun times, right? But I came into his office one time, you know, it was about 10, 15 years ago. And this paper he had on his desk was 50% highlighted in four different colors. And I go, Clem, that's a good one. He goes, yeah, that's McCulley. I go, who's McCulley? It turns out McCulley is like 15 miles down the street. We're on uh, Boylston Street in Boston and he's at the VA in West Roxbury. And so I called up McCulley and said, Dr. McCauley, Dr. Trump, my colleague is doing homocysteine testing and you're the pioneer. Would you care to have lunch? And we had lunch in two weeks, six hour lunch and now we're still really close friends. Um, but he wrote this paper, vulnerable plaque formation from obstruction of vasovasorum by homocysteine and oxidized lipoprotein aggregates, so on and so forth. And I think it's, um, it explains Alzheimer's very well in my opinion. And cardiovascular but, disease. And, of course. <laughs> and, and what it really says, it's not a tongue twister, but when you grasp it, it's so simple. Vascular disease is a disease of the small vessel of the large vessel. It's not a, every picture in every cardiology office is this big plaque in a big vessel. It's all coming from the outside. The plaque is coming from the outside no different than a zit on your face. You know, it came from the inside from acne, acne vulgaris, right, the infection. Or white blood cell um, invasion of the, of the infected tissue. 100%, neutrophils. LDL is coming in there. Cholesterol is coming in there to try to save the day, so on and so forth. So the only thing I'm, I'll say about the ill-defined conditions is that Chronic infection, stealth infection plays a very significant role that's completely overlooked. And every infectious disease doctor that says you can't use IgG, um, even when IgG is non-existent, you treat infection, they, people get better. You can use IgG, it comes down. People get better, it works. Dr. Trump did that for 35 years. So, you know, chlamydials knock out the body's own cancer defense. That's a Nobel Prize, Max Planck. What did Max Planck say in 1900? Change in science happens one funeral at a time. So that's what we're, we're fighting here. But, um, you know, organisms like chlamydophilia pneumoniae will reprogram the DNA of a, of a, a host uh, cell. So they're very, they're very sneaky. Um, Mass General gets this. This is the Mass General's COVID-19 treatment guidance. 
So they're doing, okay, they might, I don't see a lipid panel here. Interesting, but lipids everything for everybody else. Okay, metabolic panel, but they're doing, you know, tissue degradation, inflammation, CBC with diff, looking at lymphocytes, clotting factors. Why are they doing viral serologies? Because they know we all have a pre-existing burden and the people with the highest pre-existing burden are the ones that are gonna have most severe COVID. And they're even wow. doing bacterial cultures. They recognize that there's uh, bacterial burdens. Why so, aren't they assessing an eight immune um, response or quantification? Looks like well, they're, they're totally ignoring that innate immune response to viral infections. Exactly. Well, that you know, they're doing lymphocyte count just for COVID, but you know, they're doing the CBC, but that's yeah. But this is a this is a superior workup compared to most places. <laughs> most and, definitely. And and, and sadly. They learned it from the Chinese studies in the Wuhan hospital. So application, a little blurry, <clears throat> but I'll go over a couple case studies. 62 year old male, type two diabetes, or RA, obesity. He was a D minus on our risk scale and a 102.2 on our chronic disease temperature scale. And after six months, he was a C plus, not an A, and a 100.3, not 98.6. But he had Lyme disease, HSV, mycoplasma, cytomegalovirus, uh, had a severe Herx, his Herxheimer's reaction lasted three months. But we essentially cleared up his RA. He went from couldn't make a fist to back using his machine, you know, work, running his machine shop. Here's a lady very similar, toxoplasma, mycoplasma, Lyme hematophilia pneumonia, mild Herxheimer's reaction, D to a B, did a good job on her blood. But this lady couldn't wash her hands for a year and her feet were worse. You know, these are ex, ex, you know, uh, external manifestations of internal disease. Multiple dermatologists, infrared light stuff, nothing worked. All we did with her, put her on cod liver oil, fix the diet a little bit, took her off her statin drug and in five months, things started happening. And you know, she sent us these pictures and uh, Bredesen's coming. I can guarantee you that if you watch this video that Dr. Trump reversed the most severe case ever reversed in history or at least documented history. So um, let me, uh, may I? Fire away. Show you. So that's kind of the end of our thing anyway, of going over our, our mechanisms, how we make people better. Let me see if I can figure out how to um, get this video to play. I got to escape it. Grab the. My daughter was his tech. My daughter was between schools, and Dr. Trump said, Why don't you come? be my eye tech for a while. And so she did. And uh, so we had a very small narrow window where, where um, we had um, we actually did video work. Then try like you're going to bring it up like you're trying to drink. Okay, and put it back down. Okay. Can you grab that then? See, then, then if I give it to you, see that that's, I'll give it to you and I'll try to take it again. Are you doing it? Yeah. Okay, then put your put your hand on, on the on the just like that, close to you. Just like that, your hand. Yeah, hold them up. Like, yeah, that's good. See, you, you, you can, you, you see them. I'm right on this thing. I'm sure you want. So I'm sure. So next time we'll do that. Try to put your finger like that together. Don't, not fix. No. Just leave your fingers loose. Yeah. Good.
Not since. I'll run before that to decide to stir up coffee with your cup. I would say about two months. Two months before I saw it here. Yeah. You were in very good shape that you could actually. Yeah, it would, it would be stacked and then it kept trying to get it up to its mouth and it would fall. And then you couldn't find it again. So. And now you're going to do that? No? And what about this cup of coffee? It would shake so much. It's, you'd have to have a straw in it. Yeah. So he would spill it all over himself. Yeah. When did the memory start to go on? Oh, nothing wrong with my memory. No, he has a memory. He just can't remember words. He can describe. He can describe whatever, but he can't remember what the word is sometimes. What we're building very often never. Yeah, it has. Yeah. Yeah. How, how can you tell him that? Because when I'm talking to him, he doesn't ask me so much. The same question again. Or, you know, he doesn't describe as much. Like, he goes, you know that thing that's round and orange? You know, like, it's an orange. Yeah. Something like that. Now you ask for an orange. Yeah, he doesn't seem to be. Can you, can you just take the cup and hold it like a ginger cool drink too? Good job. Before, it's like this. Yes. Even with the how, fork. How long can you hold it, Sam? I don't know. See, before it's putting his elbow, yes, yes, it is. Your two hands side by side like that. Yeah. Like that. No, it was like this. <laughs> Is it seven months of therapy that I did that by now? Um, Jim. 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 But before he was shaking my hand. Oh, yeah. It, it, he would be bothered, like, he didn't even finish his plate after a while because it was, like, not worth fighting for the food. And now he's asking you. Oh, yeah. He has a good appetite. So, um, you know, I think the point missed in that whole thing is uh, he wasn't, he was hardly a, a shell of a human, non-communicable, really not functional. His, his memory was probably the, the least of his problems, but, you know, he was treated for, for Lyme and for Chlamydia pneumonia and, and things of that nature with antibiotics of all things. And that's what Dr. Dr. Trump didn't have a lot of opportunity to really, as an ophthalmologist, to manage consistent care for individuals. So he had to he had to take uh, not risk, but he had to he had to be aggressive to try to solve complex problems with very little very little time resource. So. Um, but that's basically, we adopted his problem, a program. Dr. Carter brought the functional side in. So we're a little less uh, aggressive on pharmaceuticals, more alternative methods to, to manage disease. But I think this, our strength is uh, in simple yet sophisticated measurement. I think that's really what our, what our strength is. I see a bunch of questions in chat. Steve, are they all answered already or? Um, there's only one about osteoporosis that um, hasn't been brought up, at least I think. Susan may have seen something that I missed. Um, but I have one. Let Dr. Carter chime in on osteoporosis, Joseph, and then I'll we'll sure. fire away. Uh, what was the question is the what? Well, it was just uh, how does osteoporosis fit into this model? And um, she says, I was told I have it, but the measurement seemed a bit flaky. And there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, what measurement? Was it a DEXA scan or, or what have you? That would be the standard, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, still, you know, of course, the standard of care, you know, places, especially women, on calcium supplements. And that's absolutely the wrong thing to do, especially with the calcium supplements that that are prescribed or 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 touted to get from, you know, Walmart or or what have you, you know, because the calcium carbonate is, is basically like taking stones. And ultimately, especially in a low vitamin D, magnesium, vitamin K2 environment. Um, which again, most of America is deficient in. Um, when you take that extra calcium, 
um, it doesn't end up in the bones or the teeth where it's supposed to end up. And it of course ends up in the arteries and in the kidneys um, and in tendons and, and so forth. So this calcium is, is deposited in areas where it should not be. So of course we teach our patients, you know, yes, uh, take the extra vitamin D, but also you want to make sure you're taking vitamin K2 with that, as well as magnesium um, to make sure that calcium is shuttled all the way to the area where it's supposed to go. Now you can also use um, boron and strontium. You know, those are good nutrients uh, that help uh, improve bone strength as well. And of course, exercising and, and all of those things. So. Yeah, and that's the, and, you know, that's also the mineral it. side versus the protein side, which would be collagen protein. Absolutely. And, you know, and like I said, I, I love doing micronutrient tests, you know, um, I like uh, Vibrant America. They have a really nice, you know, um, stratification. And SpectraCell, of course, they started it a number of years ago. And then Vibrant um, kind of improved on that, showing um, all three uh, arenas. So you get serum, you get the white blood cell and the red blood cell um, nutrient values, probably about 36 different nutrients. And, and you can then correlate that with absorption you know, because of course, with the preponderance of leaky gut and, you know, dysbiosis and, and what have you, there's a lot of malabsorption going on as well. Joseph? Yes. <clears throat> so first of all, thanks for this impressive vast of information. I learned a lot. I was wondering who, who is the target audience for uh, the people that come to see seek advice is it the people like in the three case studies where they have uh, some severe conditions or are these people that uh, want to be proactive and and maybe be at the bottom of uh, the continuum and are trying to uh, avoid or to uh, minimize uh, their chances of uh, moving up the curve you know joseph if we could get people earlier on you know, like the, the people I tend to get, I, I tell you, late, late stage, you know, uh, last resort, they've been through everything. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example. I had an 82 year old with dementia. And when I got him, his white blood cell count was 1 million. 1 million. And he's basically like this, non-responsive. He, he did die of COVID. But, you know, I'll just give you an example of what his son wrote to me. His son oversaw his care. But basically, he said, um, my dear father passed, but I know someone else you can help. Hope you don't mind me passing on your contact. Really think my father's quality of life improved before COVID, largely thanks to you. So it's like, I don't even want to take people on like that. It's like, it's so, but the family wants to feel like they're doing something. And with this gentleman, I'll tell you what we did. Um, he, he was so, it was so obvious, he was so malabsorbed. His gut was so dysfunctional, completely gray. So I told his son Aaron, I said, look, you know, you can take him out. Get a, get a Myers infusion. So it's a mineral infusion intravenous, it avoids the gut. On his second Myers cocktail, cocktail, he started speaking in coherent sentences for the first time in two years. So his problem had nothing to do with his brain and the lady with osteoporosis had nothing to do with your bones. It has everything to do with you are what you absorb. You know, my mother's story is, you know, she broke her second hip under the care of her PT and we're at Harvard and some doctor is trying to force Fosamax and calcium on my mother. <laughs> that was a bad day for her. That was a really bad day. I literally had, she had the nerve of saying, I'm talking to your mother, at which time I informed her that I am throwing you out of this room. <laughs> and I had a good, I made friends with the gerontologist, Uman Yuvada at, at Brigham and Women's who, um, you know, 
would oversee uh, geriatric patients, but you know, crazy stuff. Crazy. But I, let me give you let me give you an interesting story. Uh, I live in the in the Bay Area, uh, about ten miles south of Palo Alto. Uh, we have a social group of fifteen highly educated guys, all retired, been in high tech, very successful. I'm having difficulties uh, convincing them to even consider A1C, let alone fasting insulin. Yeah. I cannot even imagine telling them to pay attention to your lecture and, and take even 5% of uh, all the critical information. I cannot, I don't really know what would be the proper uh, marketing uh, programs that you can take to even bring into your services uh, people that might be interested in uh, in being proactive. I, I just, it's amazing. I mean, uh, let, uh, not even speaking about the, the type two uh, that is uh, is uh, increasing uh, significantly worldwide in the U.S. and elsewhere. So how can how can we all take the information, all the statistics, all the analysis, all the findings, all the recommendation, and uh, communicate and teach? Even one percent of the population to pay attention. I, I just don't really you know, know what that's. That's something we we're we're working hard at. You know, Dr. Carter has made this connection to Dr. Randall Maxey, who's he's in L.A. Michael. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, who was former head of the National Medical Association, and now he's formed this Black Health Trust, and he recognizes that we need to integrate really good chronic care with the existing system that we can't, you know, we can't be at odds with each other. We have to work together. And so that's an avenue we're going down. And, you know, our, our, our stick is to that population. There's, um, there's about umpteen tens of millions of, of people in the church groups associated with Maxi and our associated groups that we're trying to get someone an authority position to say, this is important for you to do. And, and that's, that's the best we have right now. But I actually have a contract, Dr. Kerner and I have a contract to bring these, these analytics to Thailand and Singapore for Alzheimer's because they recognize that it's the second leading cause of early death and cost in Thailand. Yeah. There are a million two sufferers out of a population of 65 million. And the uh, royal family is tired of, sh of shelling out thirty billion dollars for this. So there are places. So that, uh, yeah, but the, the thing, Joseph, the is that, over the over the last six or seven years, we've been mostly in the corporate environment, and now we're bringing this out to the retail consumer environment. So we've you know gained all of the efficiencies of the platform. We've made it very affordable also for the masses. And obviously, you know, the sicker someone is, it, it really just goes into a bit higher cost uh, stratification when you're adding on a lot of the, the deep dive functional medicine tests and more time from us or, you know, our health coaches or so forth. But for the, the vast majority of the, the uh, let's say the apparently healthy population, like you were saying, the, the 15 or so guys that you have in your group, and I presume they are, quote unquote, apparently healthy, or they might have hypertension or, or one disease or, or something like that. But they're missing these uh, values that they do not get from the standard of the care. I call these the, the invisible markers that they have, they have never been acquainted with. And their traditional doctors really don't know about them either. So when you go in and you get, you know, this whole battery of executive tests, you know, and, and you get the standard battery of labs, and then the next week you all of a sudden have a heart attack and it's like, oh my goodness, he was totally healthy. But the markers that would have shown that were never obtained. I'm with you, by the way, just a couple of comments. We live in Singapore for two years. I can tell you, I can see why Singapore as a country would be the number one country that might appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not surprised. But going back to my other comment, the first 20 minutes of every annual physical 
that I uh, have with my internal medicine doctor, the first 20 minutes is arguing why I'm not taking statins. Right, exactly. And, and, and finally, you know, it got to the point where I told him, uh, look, we're not going to go anywhere with that. I'm not taking statins. Just forget about it. Right. And, um, uh, Joseph, you. Joseph, one of yeah. the things that you can do is say, uh, you know, the fact that you're, you keep pushing statins on me is abuse. <laughs> yes. Stop it. <laughs> and if you do it again, I will report you to your superior. Let's talk about something where um, I'm receptive. Now, when you're dealing with your friends, if they're not receptive, I mean, a closed mind, you can't force a closed mind open. Now, you might be able to plant a seed that will bloom in them, but there can't be any force involved for it to bloom. Right. It has to be, they have to be open enough to hear something. And so if you could say, well, you know, yeah, you know, you've got this issue and you're gonna have, uh, you know, your knees are gonna bother you in five years. And in five years, their knees start bothering them they might remember what you said and change something. But yeah. Yeah. So you know, the, the other thing that you might be able to do is if they're macho is, is make, a, make a wager. You know, well, the, issue, the caveat to that is you must make sure that your homocysteine, your C-reactor protein, your insulin, your sed rate, your fibrinogen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all of those inflammatory markers are optimal, not just normal. That's a really key point. Because if you're just looking at the standard of care for those markers, then you're still behind the eight ball. So yes, cholesterol can play a role. So if you're looking at the particle size, you know, the, the high number of small particles and the LP little a and the apo lipoprotein B pattern and the oxidized LDL and the um, plaque two and all of that, then those can be confounding factors when combined with other inflammatory markers. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the concept that Dr. Carter, uh, for my group to recognize that a chronic condition that they may discover in the next two to three years actually started 15, 20 years ago. Absolutely. It's a concept that they, they don't understand. So it's a- uh, What kind I'm, of- I'm, uh, gonna, I'm gonna lose this battle with them. So. You, you said they were retired engineers? Yeah, we all retired, we all retired high tech successful okay. executive in various companies here. We have been here for 35, 40 years. And I'm telling you, when it comes to health issues, are they, unbelievable. do they understand mechanical engineering? They do. Uh -huh. So if you talk about, for example, what happens to a machine if you stop changing the oil? What happens to their car if they stop changing the oil? Will they understand that analogy? Yeah, but they, they could push back and say, I have a doctor, I trust him. Okay, uh, I, I uh, outsource that's emotional. Him. Yeah. What, 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 what is the age range? Um, so the youngest one is 58. And, okay. uh, the, no. it, it's a mid 60s uh, on average, early so, 60s, mid 60s. So Dr. Lewis showed you all of those individuals, very affluent individuals who had access to every standard of care and they ended up dead at 60 or having a massive heart attack. So that is one way that you can say to these individuals, well, don't you want to live a long life and enjoy the, the monetary benefit that you acquired over these years? No. And your standard of care doctor no. is missing what can take you out tomorrow. Yeah, but if they don't want to live, why would they worry about that? They don't no, I mean, <laughs> if they're not looking forward to waking up every morning, why well, would they care? So let me, let me tell you where we're going. You know, we, we're going down many channels because, you know, we have a platform. Um, but so we're working with uh, Dr. Maxi. We're working with a bunch of groups. So there's a new insurance company that doesn't return my calls, but I know at some point we're going to be in, integrated with them. So it'll become more of a, if you want to get low cost, high quality health insurance, you would be taking our analytics in theory, that's that's the plan. But you know they're having a hard time executing too because they're fighting an eight hundred billion dollar insurance industry. Yeah. But where I think we're going next is we're going to take our because when I showed you that sheet and you couldn't read, we did analytics on every disease, and uh, I used to lecture on is cancer an infectious disease. And Johns Hopkins just created a 
algorithm called Cancer Seek. And they have a spinoff company that A Round raised $110 million. And there are only markers that are there if the tumor is already present. So we're, we've developed with our testing an algorithm, the continuum concept algorithm. And we, you know, like, like Bredesen coined his five different, six different types. We have the six different, we talked about that, the six different types for cancer. And um, we'll I think we have access to like Ty Bollinger has a 20 million um, email list, truth about cancer series, things of that nature. And I, I think this is a, a more emotional disease. You mentioned emotional, Steve. This is a more emotional disease than a lot of the other diseases and maybe an avenue where we can gain some traction here in the US, particularly if, you know, if Hopkins can raise that kind of money, right now we're looking for a university affiliation to the Black Health Trust to dump our technology onto and, and create the spinoff, of, you know, kind of like go back door and then spin it out and show the hospital affiliation or the university affiliation and, the, and then the algorithm. And I think people will kind of want this test. Because we do well, the- I think that it's, if you can build a system of credibility uh, where people can look at it and see that it's um, in a sense all being promoted by middle-aged white males in lab coats with stethoscopes around their necks, all those kinds of trappings of prejudice um, that it, it may fly. But, you know, in terms of Joseph and his, his, his friends, they're, they have a belief system. It's like a religion and they're attached to it and, and changing a point of view that is belief. It's not just about information, it's about belief. There's all this emotional loading on it that has to be unloaded before it can change. Question, um, Joseph, so do, do any of them have any fear of this coronavirus? Uh, we, all, we all do. And uh, mm -hmm. the one thing that uh, we talked a lot about is at least make sure that your vitamin D, because right. that's a very popular subject uh, since uh, early this year. Yeah. Needs to be between 60 and 80, optimally. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the extent, and we all wear masks, and we're trying to social distance as much as we can. Okay. And we well, uh, go uh, for hikes in parks where we can easily uh, keep the space or the distance. But I can tell you, 99.9% .9 of all the information that I just heard today in these past two hours is complete Chinese to them. It's complete Chinese to them. They decided- Well, that, uh, that's bad. Right, but the point, the point I would like to make is, you know, since there is a fear, and, and people should have somewhat of a healthy fear, if, especially if you are not optimizing things, this is something else that you can go back to them with because there are apparently healthy people that are succumbing to this and being placed in the hospital and on a ventilator and ending up dying. So would you like to improve your chances of not contracting this virus and having a bad outcome. So do a different spin and then, and then discuss with them if your inflammatory markers are high, if you're, and, all right, you're, they already know their vitamin D level needs to be optimized, but their zinc level needs to be optimized, their magnesium, their selenium, you know. Vitamin whole, A. Yeah, exactly. Whole host of things, there, there are tons of things. So, so maybe you should go down that pathway and say, well, why don't we just all take a deeper dive? Because we know our traditional doctors, they don't even believe in vitamin C. You know, a handful may believe in vitamin D, but you know, you take a look at the frontline critical care doctors who actually develop the, the, the math protocol, you know, the methylpenicillone, the, the aspirin, the heparin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, now they've added uh, ivermectin. So, but does anyone hear about ivermectin? And these are high level critical care doctors at you know, high level institutions. And they have added this to the, um, the protocol for, for the um, early onset of coronavirus you know, symptomatology. So, so again, they understand the, the mechanisms of this antiparasitic that also has um, properties like hydroxychloroquine, which you know, worked as a uh, iontophore, which allowed zinc into the cells, which 
allowed for its antiviral capacity to occur, you know? So that is critical. You know, when people have, you know, the, the loss of sense of taste and smell, that tells you, you the body is consuming zinc, right? So that tells you now you are also now zinc deficient. So again, that may be a way to approach these guys and say, well, hey, you know what? You know, because masks, I know there's a whole big controversy on that, but ultimately masks is not, is not going to protect you from a, a virus that is submicroscopic, right? Now, if someone's coughing, hacking, spitting, sneezing and all that, yeah, I mean, that's, that's obvious, but just normal breathing, normal talking and, and so forth, and, and you are not in your own self-contained hazmat suit, this, this is going to circulate. So everyone is ultimately going to be exposed to this. So in order for them to improve their chances of staying healthy, not getting this virus, but ultimately all of us are going to be exposed to it. And, and of course, with there's a whole lot of controversy with the PCR testing. And there are actually, in fact, a lot of you know, false positives because of the cycle rate. There's, you know, you know, the the companies are generally doing very high cycle rates at 45, and you really should not be doing more than 17 to 20, maybe 25. But the higher you do that amplification, uh, the more you have a high false pos positivity rate. So, so, but be that as it may, people are still scared of this, right? But that may be a way for you to interact with them. Um, I, I kind of agree with you, but if it wasn't for the Trump Biden election, which uh, hijacked all the discussion, <laughs> uh, yeah. I just uh, left me with no chance or even uh, moving the topic of discussion. Uh, uh, Joseph, the let me let me um, let me back up and and take Michael's response on a different level. And if you if there is a word that you can connect them to in terms of like what I use in my book is pre-existing conditions, mm -hmm. where it opens you up to a bad COVID outcome and to say, you know, the, the model is the iceberg and the pre-existing conditions of age and, and um, heart disease and um, diabetes, these are on the tip of the iceberg that's sticking up above the ocean. But if you go underneath, you've got leptin resistance and insulin resistance and, and nutrient deficiencies and things like that. And if they respond to that word, that idea of pre-existing conditions, that may be a way that you can present this as finding out what your hidden yes. pre-existing conditions are. Absolutely. Yeah, good idea. Okay. Yeah. In any event, I'll let other people Do you know anybody who can di diagnose pre-existing conditions? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. I've got all kinds of self-care things. I mean, if you're if you're looking at zinc, you know, anything that affects your oh, yeah. your smell and your taste. And there's even these zinc solutions that you can get that are right at the concentration. If it tastes sweet, you're zinc deficient. If it tastes um, acrid, your your oh, yeah. zinc is better and things like that. Yeah. So they have a whole host of uh, nutrients or, or minerals that you can do, and that's a you know very inexpensive way to test your mineral deficiencies. And the D test is not expensive. Right, it's not, it's not. Again, I mean, in, in the grand scheme of things, none of these tests that we do are really exorbitant, especially when you compare them to the standard of care medicine and what they dole out, it's especially in terms of, you know, these, you know, uh, the medications that, the, the, you know, costly medications, not necessarily the generic ones, but you know, there's a high cost and, of course, a whole lot of side effects to, you know, these multiple medications and in all of the, you know, uh, tests, you know, diagnostic tests, those aren't inexpensive, you know, so functional medicine really comes in at very comparable levels, even though people don't see it that way for the most part, because in functional medicine, it's not covered by insurance. So, but there are some balancing of that because a lot of people also have high deductible insurance, you know, policy. So you might have a $5,000 deductible. So you're still coming out of pocket anyway. So there's a whole lot that can be done with $5,000 in a functional medicine, you know, milieu. So, so again, but you, 
for that $5,000 that you would have paid seeing your traditional doctor, no way compares from a chronic disease status, what can be done in a functional format. Now acute care, that's, that's a totally different animal. But if we're talking about chronic disease, there, there is no comparison. There's a question about what is the COVID prevention protocol and where can that be found? So, so again, what we want to optimize, we ideally, you know, we would want to do a full micronutrient test, you know, all 36 different nutrients, you know, including like glutathione and, you know, vitamin C and, and, you know, zinc and, and all of those things, your, all of your B vitamins, all of these things need to be optimized. But short of that, you know, we have kind of like a foundational protocol, like food-based multivitamins, you know, of course, vitamin C. Ideally, you're doing, yeah, let's say two grams of liposomal vitamin C a day, which is it's a good baseline. Obviously, you know, vitamin C can be ramped up to mega, mega, mega doses without any, you know, ill effects. Um, we like high level oil you know, taking, you know, a tablespoon to two tablespoons of that on a daily basis. Very, very beneficial. You know, of course, your vitamin D, everyone needs to be taking somewhere between 2,500 and 10,000 IUs, depending on where your level are, it is. You know, K2 from 100 to probably 300 micrograms. The, the studies show that 300 micrograms, you know, vitamin K2 in the MK7 form really has shown over time to um, decrease um, uh, vascular rigidity. Um, and of course, zinc, somewhere between the 20 to 30 milligrams a day, up to about 50 milligrams a day. You really don't want to do too much over 50 milligrams because then it'll start upsetting your copper balance. I like selenium at 200 micrograms a day. Um, I like quercetin. You know, there are some other, you know, really good studies showing the antiviral effects of quercetin and a whole host of other things. Um, that's a flavonoid um, at 500 to 1,000 micrograms uh, BI, uh, twice a day. And, and those are good starter things. You know, they're, they're a whole host of other things that, you know, can be brought into the fray. You know, obviously if you have, you know, dental issues, you have periodontal disease, that needs to be, uh, you know, worked on. You know, we, we really do, like we do oral DNA tests, which will show, you know, um, at a DNA level, what pathogens in your mouth are contributing to disease. You know, 70% of America has per some form of periodontal disease. So that's going to drive, you know, in immune dysfunction. You know, the vast majority of us have leaky gut, basically from the foods that we eat, the contaminated you know, well, the hybridization and genetically modified foods, you know, with gluten and dairy and, you know, the pesticides that are sprayed on the non-organic fruits and vegetables, all of these things, you know. And zinc deficiency too. Yeah, exactly. All of these things causing leaky gut, 70 to 80% of our immune system is guess what? In our gut, you know, but it's the whole, you know, McKilsel, you know, milieu from the, the, the nose all the way down to the anus. So this is a very, you know, critical barrier that is being compromised where the vast majority of our immune system, you know, with our secretory IgA is located. So when that is compromised, that is going to, you know, halt your body's ability to fully stave off infections. So it just, just a whole host of things you know, like I said, you know, earlier, I, I'm also trained by Dr. Bredesen, you know, so when you're looking at all the different causes of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia, and so forth, you know, you're looking at the inflammation, you're looking at the, the diabetic profile, you're looking at your hormones. So, um, you know, low testosterone, estradiol, you know, cortisol levels, you know, thyroid, those play a critical role. Uh, having mercury toxicity, aluminum, um, lead, whole host of, you know, heavy metals compromise our immune system as well. And those are very, very common metals that come from silver amalgams. They come from eating large fish. They come from vaccines, 
whole host of things. You know, then we might look at, you know, um, the mycotoxins from mold. 25% of the population is actually sensitive to mold. Mold is everywhere. You could, you look at, you could potentially live in a moldy house. You could work in a moldy office. But once you get to that level where the body can't detoxify enough, then you start having symptoms. So, so again, it becomes like this perfect storm, you know, when, when a person, again, is apparently healthy and all of these things are brewing underneath. And a lot of those things really don't show up on traditional tests. They just don't. So you just don't know. And one of our colleagues um, in a remote patient monitoring company that, um, we, um, that I'm on the medical advisory board of, 60 years old, um, uh, black belt, worked out all the time, died of a heart attack at, at the gym, 60, 60 years old, and yeah. apparently I guy, healthy. I have a guy who's 80 years old who suddenly has uh, muscle weakness and chronic fatigue syndrome, and he goes into the clinic, and they spend like six hours on him. I don't know how he got them to spend six hours on him. And they basically tell him, you're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. Go home. <laughs> so, so it was kind of like him. Yeah. I mean, but you got to dig deep. Is it, is it heavy metals? You know, and especially someone at that age, you know, you're going undergoing bone remodeling. So lead is stored in the bones. So as you lose bone, lead comes out. So if you can't detoxify, Again, that is going to cause muscle weakness, cognitive decline, whole host of things. So that's not something that a traditional doctor would really look at. So, but, you know, but that's what, that's the beauty of functional medicine. We go down so many different pathways, you know, uh, like, uh, I don't know if Dr. Lewis said it earlier somewhere in the slides, but we ask the why instead of what you have. You know, the what is, what, what is your diagnosis? But why do you have that diagnosis? So that's where functional medicine comes in. We dig deep to find out why you have that. Makes sense to me. Yeah. Someone asked, uh, any recommendations on how to detox? Depends on what you're detoxing. <laughs> so, you know, the liver and the kidney, you know, are the body's main detoxification organis uh, organs. So a lot of us have, you know, poor ability to detox. So, you know, phase one, phase two detoxification pathways. Um, again, kind of in the standard of care medicine, you know, looking at your, you know, liver function tests. Um, optimal is different from standard of care. So mild elevations in that tell us there's something going on. You know, looking at things like GGT, you know, looking at your triglycerides, you know, because now <laughs> fatty liver is, you know, rising at epidemic levels. And that's coming from what, you know, the refined carbohydrates. So if you have fatty liver, again, that's going to compromise your liver's ability to detoxify. So, um, and we're, we live in a very, very toxic environment. So, you know, using things like, you know, milk thistle, uh, N-acetylcysteine, glutathione, et cetera, you know, different things that help rev up the liver. Calcium deglucrate is another really, really good one, especially when you're dealing with uh, estrogen dominance and so forth. But a whole host of things that can uh, help with that. Elimination, you know, bowel movements. A lot of people are very constipated and they really don't know that or they don't interpret it as being constipated. So if you're not eliminating, you're just recirculating, you know, these toxins in the body. So that's a critical area. Just lymphatic drainage in, in general, you know, people don't exercise, you know, getting on a trampoline or, you know, that the little bounce thing or whatever, I can't remember what they call it. Um, but rebounders. I have, I, yeah, I have a nine-year-old and we have a trampoline out back. So I'm on the trampoline, you know, five days a week with her. <laughs> so, um, but we also yeah. have a culture of, uh, sterilization. 
you know, fear of microbes. And so Absolutely. we keep our kill children away from them and we sterilize our hands every 15 minutes. Absolutely. And, you know, Absolutely. our immune systems aren't being educated like they used, They're not. used to be. Absolutely. Steve, I assume, I assume you're aware of pandas. Pandas? PDA oh, yes. -E yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. You know, that, that tends to occur in upper middle class uh, communities. And it's all the, it's all the hygiene hypothesis. Yeah, the kids have been kept in a bubble. Yeah, we'll know that we're enlightened when we start spraying soil microbes in hospitals. Yeah, absolutely. You said that the other day. I, yeah. I love I I love using spore based probiotics for my patients, and that is really really important now. Um, you know that that just that can turn most people around. You know, in amazing, amazing ways. So, um, so yeah. I mean, you just there. There are just so many avenues that just aren't are not addressed in the traditional medicine. You know, dy dynamic that um, it's 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 unfortunate. And you know, with with this whole coronavirus, you know, a lot of people are really dying needlessly because if it were touted everywhere to boost all of your nutrient levels, not just vitamin D, but vitamin D is important, but then they don't really tell you how much you should be taking, right? You know, I've come across so many different people and they have absolutely no idea. It's, oh yeah, I'm they, taking my vitamin D. Or they I'm, do, they yeah. tell you not to take more than 2000 units. <laughs> right, exactly, <laughs> they, yeah. So, you know, and that's absurd, absurd. So, you know, or, you know, I, I come across several, oh yeah, I'm pounding, you know, uh, vitamin D and vitamin C gummies. Like, no, that's, that's really not a good thing. Not a good thing at all. So, so again, you know, people, th that's what we want to do in this the cost-effective model, really, is share that with as many people as we possibly can so that they become educated. And since we also have our online learning management system where we have archived, you know, uh, videos um, from, you know, just different subjects and so forth, the person can kind of learn at their own pace. Um, so, so again, it really makes it more affordable. We have health coaches that, really can take on the baton after Dr. Lewis and I have done a, a deeper dive because you really, for the most part, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like the Jenny Craig Weight Watchers model. You know, it's an accountability thing. So you give all the good information up front, but you need someone to prod you on a weekly or, you know, you know every other week basis to say, all right, Mrs. Jones, all right, we, we gave you all of this stuff. Have you cut this out of your diet? Have you started exercising? Have you started taking this supplement? You have to remind them. So, so having the health coaches for those people who are not self-motivated is really an, an important feature, but that can be done also in a cost-effective manner. So that's, that's really the beauty of our platform. You know, we make it, very relatable to the masses because everyone, you know, you, you do the questionnaire, you get a grade. Everybody wants an A or a B, right? So if you get a C, D, or F, that tells you, hmm, I answered some questions that weren't very good. <laughs> so in that classroom of health, I'm, I'm, you know, not doing so great. And then, you know, you do, we do the biomarkers and you get a temperature of 103. And everybody knows 98.6 is normal. So that that becomes a very visceral thing for the average person. Hmm. Now, when I went to my doctor last week, he told me I was totally healthy. And now you're telling me I have a temperature of 103. What gives? So then that gives us the opportunity to dive deeply with them. So then, then the light bulb goes on. It's like, oh my God, I, I've never even seen these you know, blood values. And you mean, mean to tell me that these are the things that can actually cause me to have a heart attack or have Alzheimer's? Yes. 
So. Right. Good. Thank well, you. We, you know, we, we recommend standard tests. I like people to get a calcium score. Um, Absolutely. Of that yeah. nature. So there are, there are things, you know, for brain inflammation, I mean, some of the biologic drugs might have a place. You never, you know, uh, Dr. Artemanoff, one of our colleagues is doing for um, uh, pain. He has a pain management clinic in Pennsylvania where he's doing biologic injections. I, I can't exactly tell you how he does it. It's kind of proprietary to him, but you know, we have to downregulate inflammation. Uh, we have to, we have to figure out why. Yeah, peptides. Yeah. So peptides work marvelously well. Yep. Uh, I, to... I love the, the peptides. So yeah. those are, those, that's another whole realm, you know, even though of course the FDA is kind of coming down on the pharmacies that are doing some of the more exotic peptides, <laughs> but th those, those things can be miraculous. But what we are still left with, it's really, really good. Uh, uh, modalities for a whole host of disease syndromes. So for you to uh, even hope to get as many people to appreciate and uh, take advantage of your platform, uh, you have to reduce the friction. And the friction is measured by the amount of time and energy for me as, a, as an interested individual to give you the data you need to do the analysis. Mm -hmm. What What right. is the friction? Is it hours of... Uh, questionnaire and uh, and test and specific test that you request what what the, what no, is the, I mean what is the thing, it's not really that much of a friction because the the question I mean so Dr. Lewis developed you know many questionnaires you know so it could be like a 20 question questionnaire which can be done very quickly and then you can graduate to the 121 questions you know, but just doing the, the database of 20 to 25 questions still tells us a lot. Getting your blood drawn, that's, that's really easy. That's, that's quick. So again, and then you sit down with us for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, you know, you see your report. It's, it's you know, very easily readable, very visual. So it's not a time consuming adventure. It really isn't. It's you, you, again, we feel that because of the coronavirus, our platform is hopefully going to be entertained more because we are trying to connect the dots of what these invisible factors are that you've never seen and how they correlate with you getting the coronavirus and having bad symptoms or potentially uh, ultimately a uh, you know, sub being subdued by it. So, so to your point, to your point too about the survey length or whatever, you know, we're we're skipping the intake form, but we're basically digitizing an intake form, but using what Cleveland Clinic uses in their functional group. Um, and if someone's not willing to do a 20, 25 minute survey to give us a whole body of data, then that puts us in a compromised position of guessing what the heck's going wrong with them. They're really not committed. As much yeah. as we'd like to try to figure out how we can move them over the inertial barrier and get them committed, they have to have some level of commitment in this because basically- 30 minutes our, versus changing their habits. I mean, changing habits is one of the hardest things that humans right. have to do. That's why you need the health coaches. You, oh, yeah. you need and, someone to prod right. them along. We, you, the only way we're gonna be successful is we have to empower the individual with information that makes sense to them that they can then you know, it becomes part of their culture, like we right. said. So. Again, everyone should be very nervous about this virus. So, you know, not so much, again, if, if, you, if your immune system is nice and potent, like I don't really fear getting the virus or, I mean, I've probably been exposed to it, but I don't fear having a bad reaction to it. But for those who again, are not optimized, they really do need to kind of fear this because now, you know, we, we know that a number of individuals who get this and, you know, overcome it. Now we have what the long haulers. So now they're suffering from, you know, this chronic fatigue and, and all of this. Well, of course, this is just one more thing that has, you know, 
gone into their immune system and significantly compromised it along with all of the other things. So what is being told to these people by the standard of care doctors? Go rest, drink plenty of fluids. It's all, it's all being blamed on the virus instead of people's susceptibilities. Yeah, so, exactly. so those exactly. people, physiological health. Yeah, yeah. So those people, we can, we can nurse back to health because then we will show them why you feel this way. Because in addition to the coronavirus, these are all the other things that you have going wrong that you didn't yeah. know. The coronavirus is merely uncovering things that Absolutely. were buried. Absolutely. Yep. yep. Awesome. So There's all kinds of good stuff in the chat. So before we end, please save your chat. And the website is uh, will be on the presentation, or it's 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 in the chat. Okay. Yeah. How do you save the chat? Oh, the you go to chat and you. <laughs> yeah, the, the little little square with the three dots in it. You know, way yeah. down at the bottom of the chat window. Click on the three dots and it says save chat. Yeah, okay. I've given uh, Dr. Carter's um, email and my email. And I've uh, given my cell phone if anybody wants to text me. And just the healthrevivalpartners.com and yep. realhealthclinics.com. Where, where are you located there? Not that it matters now, but... Uh... I'm in Atlanta, yeah, but I have patients. We have patients everywhere. You know, telemedicine is is a beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah, when I, someone asked me. I have I have a patient in Switzerland, and in the UK right now. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But we've been doing telemedicine since day one, six seven years ago. Yeah, you have a global outreach because your your program is so novel. You've got to take your you, you know your opportunities where you can find them right well, the interesting thing is this lady called me up um she was working with marvin berman at the quiet mind foundation out, out of philadelphia and then he referred her to me and she's working for her for her mom 82 years old and it turns out she's uh one hour from winchester uk and i consult to a clinic there so she went she went and saw dr kenyon would have thunk it, right? Right. But uh, it worked out. And then I, the lady in Switzerland was an hour and a half from the best uh, chronic infectious disease person in the world, Judith McClosey, who published a paper in 1993, Alzheimer's Aspirate Ketosis with a question mark, and she's proved it over and over again. And this gal had serious infection and was already seeing at the age of 34 some early signs of glaucoma, so neurodegeneration. So I worked with her as long as I could and then just said, get an appointment with Judith. And she's now working with Judith. So you never know how we might be able to hook you up and quarterback it. But I think the most important thing is, you know, getting, we can offer a way to really do a dynamic, inexpensive initial workup to really set the stage for where you are in these continuums. And then, you know, it's a funnel approach. If we need to go, if you can afford a deeper dive or we need a deeper dive, we go down that funnel and look at, look at different, uh, different things. But you'd be surprised how much we can do with these base labs and assessments. Do you find the, the demographic in Europe much more intelligent about being sensitive to all these chronic conditions? Like uh, your, European countries forbid Monsanto to uh, bring uh, glyphosate into... Mm -hmm. uh, their countries. So something about the European population and demographic being a little bit more intelligent about it or... Well, you know, I agree with you, Joseph. Uh, what, what happens though is the national health systems are restricting uh, certain types of labs. So it's very frustrating for them to figure out how they can get these labs. But what I was told by the lady with the uh, mom with some dementia is that Private functional medicine is one of the fastest growing industries in the UK because there's so much disgruntlement with the existing system. So she sent me the labs. I don't know how much they cost her, but they were more robust than what we do um, as an initial. I mean, we can obviously go as deep as we need to, but from an initial set of inflammatory markers, uh, hormones and all that stuff, thyroid, thyroid, thyroid antibodies, all, all kinds of things were 
we're done. So that that market's expanding, but I don't really have a sense for the entire population other than just looking at the stats and they're they're generally healthier than us. So maybe they, you know, I have a I have a series which I'm only on like number eight. I'm just I don't write a lot of blogging because I'm busy, but the 26 things that make you and keep you hungry. And one of them in the United States is the USDA. They subsidize junk food. So when the socioeconomically challenged people, you choose between a bar with some good quality nuts in it versus a Snickers bar. The Snickers bar is yeah. half price. And that's all artificial based on federal, federal funding to you know, basically the swamp, you know, special interests. Yeah, it's follow the money. Yeah, absolutely. Without a doubt. Said, said. Yes. Said is a standard American diet, but also said is a... Mm -hmm. <laughs> house. Yeah, you either laugh or you cry. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, Steve. <laughs> Michael, you've got to get to know Steve because we are like, it, we're, we're now the, unfortunately, in the context of laughing or crying, we're like the three stooges. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I get it. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. It's been wonderful. And uh, I think we'll be up on YouTube in probably, you know, maybe a week and maybe two weeks. I understand that process. Thank it's you so much. It's a commitment, right? <laughs> Thank you. It is. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Take care, everybody. Don't forget to save your chat. Okay. Bye-bye. Right.